Morning, Chairman Head. <clears throat> Chairman, how are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. You're on mute, Miss John. Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Smith. Good morning. Okay, great. Good morning, Mr. Blake. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Moy, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Young, you want to go ahead and start the recording? Morning, ladies and gentlemen, the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Today's date is 12-8-2021. Public hearing will please come to order. My name is Fred Hill. I'm the Chairperson of the Board of Zoning, zoning Adjustment for the District of Columbia. Joining me today is Lauren John, Vice Chair, Board Members Carl Blake and Kershawn Smith, and Zoning Commissioner Anthony Hood, Joining the Chairman Anthony Hood. Today's meeting and hearing agenda are available on the Office of Zoning's website. Please be advised that this proceeding is being recorded by a court reporter and is also webcast live via WebEx and YouTube Live. The video of the webcast will be available on the Office of Zoning's website after today's hearing. Accordingly, everyone who is listening on WebEx or by telephone and will be muted during the hearing. Also, please be advised that we do not take any public testimony at our decision meeting sessions. If you're experiencing difficulty accessing WebEx, or with your telephone call in, then please call our OZ hotline number at 202-727-5471 to receive WebEx login or call-in instructions. At the conclusion of a decision meeting, I shall, in consultation with the Office of Zoning, determine whether a full or summary order may be issued. A full order is required when the decision it contains is adverse to a party, including effect A and C. A full order may also be needed if the board's decision differs from the Office of Planning's recommendation. Although the board favors the use of summary orders whenever possible, an applicant may not request the board to issue such an order. In today's hearing session, everyone who is listening on WebEx or by telephone will be muted during the hearing, and only persons who have signed up to participate or testify will be unmuted at the appropriate time. Please state your name and home address before providing oral testimony or your presentation. Oral presentation should be limited to a summary of the most important points. When you're finished speaking, please mute your audio so that your microphone is not picking up sound or background noise. Once again, if you're experiencing difficulty accessing anything, please call the OZ hotline number at 202-727-5471. It's also listed on the screen. All persons planning to testify either in favor or in opposition should have signed in up in advance. They'll be called by name to testify. If this is an appeal, only parties are allowed to testify. By signing up to testify, all participants complete the oath or affirmation by required by subtitle Y408.7. Request to enter evidence at the time of an online virtual hearing, such as written testimony or additional supporting documents other than live video, which may not be presented as part of the testimony, may be allowed to pursue Y103.13, provided that the person making the request to enter an exhibit explain how the proposed exhibit is relevant. The good cause justifies allowing the exhibit in the record, including an explanation of why the requester did not file the exhibit prior to the hearing pursuant to Y206 and how the proposed exhibit would not unreasonably prejudice any parties. You all can hear me, correct? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. The order of procedures for special exceptions and variances are pursuant to Y409. Appeals are pursuant to Y507. At the conclusion of each case, an individual who is unable to testify because of a technical issue may file a request to leave for file, sorry, file a request for leave to file a written version of the planned testimony to the record within 24 hours following the conclusion of public testimony in the hearing. If additional written testimony is accepted, then parties will be allowed a reasonable time to respond as determined by the board. The board will then make its decision at its next meeting session, but no earlier than 48 hours after the hearing. Moreover, the board may request additional specific information to complete the record. The board and the staff will specify the end of the hearing exactly what was expected and the date when persons must submit the evidence to the Office of Zoning. No other information shall be accepted by the board. Finally, the District of Columbia Administrative Procedures Act requires that the public hearing on each case be held in the open for the public. However, pursuant to Section 405B and 406 of the Act, the board may, consistent with its rules of procedures and the Act, enter into an emergency closed meeting on a case for purposes of seeking legal counsel on a case pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B4 and or deliberating case pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B13, but only after filing necessary public notice in the case of emergency, emergency meeting uh, closed meeting after taking a roll call vote. Mr. Secretary, do we have any preliminary matters today? Mm 
morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, there are preliminary matters, but staff would suggest that the board address those matters when the case is called. Other than other than that, I would like to cite for the record case applications that will not be heard today. First, case application number 20481. This is the application of Scott Anderson and Elizabeth Arkell has been withdrawn by the applicant. Case application number 20552. This is the appeal of Brian Jordan has been rescheduled to be heard on January the 12th, 2022. We have two applications that have been continued to March 9th, 2022. These two cases are 20567 of Hillsdale College and 20505. This is the application of Michael Farquhar. Finally, the, the two, there are two applications uh, that have been continued to March 23rd, 2022. These two are 17429A. This is the application of St. Patrick's Episcopal Church and Day School, as well as case application number 18465A. This is the application of St. Patrick's Episcopal Church and Day School. And that's it from me, Mr. Chairman. Okay, great. All right, thank you, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Vice Chair John for covering for me the past uh, few times. I really do appreciate it, and thank you for the the, the, the ability to be able to be away. Um, thank you, Ms. John. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. I won't say any time. <laughs> um, and let's see, uh, Mr. Moy, if you want to go ahead and uh, call our first uh, expedited review. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there are two cases uh, before the board for decision making in its meeting session. The first is an expedited review case which is application number 20569 of Bradley Holligan, Holligan, H-A-L-L-I-G-A-N. This is an application for special accession from the side yard requirements of subtitle D, section 206.2, and subtitle D, section 206.7. This would construct a two-story with basement, rear addition to an existing semi-detached two-story with basement, principal dwelling unit in the R1, in the R1B zone. The property is located at 5182 Fulton Street, Northwest Square, 1419, Lot 838. Okay, thank you. Are we all ready to deliberate? Okay. Um, after reviewing the record uh, and the statement from the applicant concerning how they're meeting the standards and the criteria for us to grant the relief requested um and then also the reports that we received from the office of planning and that of the anc um i didn't actually have any issues with this application i also did think they met the criteria for us to grant the special exception i would agree with the analysis that the office of planning has provided in support as well as that uh that ddot had no objection as well as the um report that the ANC had provided uh, also in support. There also are multiple neighbors letters that were in support, but I personally believe that they're meeting the standard for us to grant the relief requested and I don't have any issues with it. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Smith, do you have any comments? No, I, I completely concur with your analysis of this, um, of this particular case and I will um, also support special seven. Thank you, Vice Chair John. I have nothing to add. I, I thought your analysis was quite clear. Thank you. Mr. Blake. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I have nothing to add. I believe the analysis is quite clear and I feel comfortable supporting the special exception request. Chairman Hood. I would agree with everything I've heard thus far. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That being the case, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve application number 20569 as captioned and read by the secretary and ask for a second, Ms. John. Second. The motion made and seconded, Mr. Moore, if you could take a roll call. 
When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief request of uh, the motion to approve was seconded by Vice Chair John. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Blake. Yes. Vice Chair John. Yes. Chairman Hill. Yes. Staff would record the vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve. The motion to approve was second by, by, by Vice Chair John. Also in support of the motion to approve zoning commissioner, zoning commission chair, Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John and Chairman Hill. Staff would record voters five to zero to zero. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Um, when you have an opportunity, you can call our next one. All right, the next application is also an expedited review application. Application number 20570 of Janelle and Jonathan Hurwitz, H U R W I T Z. This um, is a request for special exceptions from the lot occupancy requirements, subtitle D, section 304.1, pursuant to subtitle D, section 5201, and subtitle X, section 902.1, and rare yard requirements, subtitle D, section 306.1. Pursuant to subtitle D, section 5201, and subtitle X, section 902.1, this would construct a second story rare addition to an existing detached two story principal dwelling unit in the R1B zone. The property is located at 3201 15th Street Northeast, square 4013, or yeah. 4013 lot 28. And what I should I say uh, for you to uh, alert you, Mr. Chairman, there was uh, uh, a, uh, a filing recorded uh, yesterday, December 7th, uh, from uh, a letter from ANC 5B um, in uh, citing no comments on a vote of five to zero to zero, even though the form, the ANC form was. Uh, dated November 18th. So that's uh, before you as well, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, unless the board has any issues, I go. I would like to go ahead and allow the ANC report into the record. And so if you have any issues, please raise your hand. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and let that into the record, Mr. Moy. Um, in terms of the application, uh, as um, I went ahead and reviewed the record and that of the um, arguments from the applicant as to why they believe they should be granted the special exception. They also had some sun shadow studies that I found, thought were helpful. Mm -hmm. I also reviewed the Office of Planning's report that was in support and their analysis, as well as that of DDOT. Uh, both adjacent properties that I thought were the most, one, you know, that were the ones that were going to be most affected by this uh, work uh, had signed off in support stating that they didn't have any concerns. Um, I'm glad to see that we did get something from the ANC officially uh, giving us their position. Uh, there was something in the record in Exhibit 9 that was speaking to how they had, the ANC commissioner had been contacted and there was some back and forth with them, the applicant, but I am glad that something came from the ANC. Uh, that being the case, I do agree with the arguments from the uh, applicant concerning how they're meeting the requirements for us to grant the relief requested, as well as the uh, analysis from the Office of Planning that was in support, and as I mentioned, DDOT and the ANCs and the adjacent property owners. So I didn't really have any issues with this application, so I'll be voting in favor. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you have anything you'd like to add? I don't have anything to add, and I agree with your analysis. Thank you. Vice Chair John? I don't have anything to add. Uh, I would just note I would also give a uh, great weight to the Office of Planning's uh, report and recommendations. Thank you. Mr. Blake? Uh, yes, sir. I have nothing to add. I would be prepared to support as well for the following reasons. Thank you. Chairman Hood? I, I would agree with everyone. I think the case is made and I will be voting to support this application. 
Thank you. That being the case, I'm going to make a motion to approve application number 20570 as captioned and read by the secretary and ask for a second, Ms. John. Second. The motion was made and seconded, Mr. Moy, if you could take a roll call. Again, when I call each of your names, if you would, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief requested, the motion was seconded by Vice Chair John. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Blake? Yes. Vice Chair John? Yes. Chairman Hill? Yes. Staff would record vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the motion to approve, seconded by Vice Chair John, also in support of the motion to approve. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, and Chairman Hill. Motion carries on a vote of five to zero to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Uh, when you get a chance, you can call our next meeting issue. Okay, yeah, meeting issue. The last <clears throat> action before the board in its meeting session is case application number 20564 of Jamal's Prospect LLC. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a um, request for advanced consideration of a request for party status in opposition to the application. And um, this is pursuant to subtitle Y, section 404. I should okay. add that the party status in opposition is by a person by the name of Benjamin Persina. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Moy. Mr. Moy, when are we supposed to hear this case? Do you know? Oh, uh, yes, I do. It is scheduled for, scheduled for, hold on. It's 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 coming up. It's it's going to December the twenty second. Okay. All right. Um, okay. In general, I guess you know, even though people are within the two hundred feet, that doesn't necessarily grant them party status. I mean, what we have to do is to see whether or not they are uniquely affected, as to whether or not they meet the criteria for party status. Um, in this case, I was a little bit unclear as to my thoughts, but after further reviewing the, uh, the proximity of their location to the, uh, property that's requesting the relief, and then also that some of the witnesses are even, uh, closer to the property that's requesting relief, as well as the ANC is opposed. I guess I would be in favor of granting party status so that we could hear more from the uh, neighbors as to um, the the case. Um, yeah, so those are uh, so I mean I'm in favor of I guess of granting the party status based on you know just kind of looking at the application and you know the uh, the standards and criteria as to how we grant party status. Um, Mr. Smith, do you have any thoughts? No, um, I, I largely agree with your analysis. You know, uh, at, at first glance, uh, at, I shared your same concerns. Um, uh, but, um, in, you know, doing a deep dive with the information that we have received and, you know, as you had stated, um, some of the, um, the witnesses that would testify if the party status was granted. Are even closer to this property um, listed um, a person uh, opposition here um, I, I, and grant that the ANC is opposed I, I, I'm also willing to grant um, a party status given that all of them are within 200 feet so I agree with your analysis Vice Chair John Mr. Chairman I've been on the fence with this one um, 
but I, I think that all things considered, I, I would be in favor of granting party status. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blake? Uh, yes, I too would be in favor of granting party status, considering the issues are traffic and trash and the location of the uh, requester is within that block. It seems to me that they would be um, more greatly impacted than the general public. So I would be comfortable uh, supporting uh, uh, in their, their participation. Chairman Hood? I'd agree with my colleagues. I, I think the key terms is in our statute says uniquely affected, and, and I think there's a case to be made that they are uniquely affected. Uh, but you know, it's a case, it's a tipping scale. You can go in both ways, but I think in this specific specific case, they are uniquely affected. Thank you. And I guess I want to have a little bit more deliberation about it or discussion about it because you know, being uniquely affected, like just because it's traffic and trash, and they're in that two hundred foot radius doesn't mean that they are more uniquely affected than any of the other people that are in the 200 foot radius, right? And the ANC is there to represent um, that area. So I don't know, that's why maybe Vice Chair John was also on the fence as I was as well, as to whether or not they should or should not be given party status. However, I think due to some of the other issues that we had brought up, um, it would be, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and I guess vote in favor of that party status. I guess what I would like to kind of mention is that if the applicant could, I know that they had proposed some conditions about some of the concerns that the party status had, as well as the ANC. Just if there is any uh, uh, dialogue that could take place between now and then, I would encourage them to continue to try to have some kind of dialogue. So that being the case, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the party status application uh, request. For application number 20564, as uh, the secretary has put forward and asked for a second, Ms. John. Second. The motion was made and second, Mr. Moore. If you could please uh, take a roll call. When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to grant the request for. Party status in opposition to a Benjamin Persena. The uh, motion was seconded by Vice Chair John. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Blake? Yes. Vice Chair John? Yes. Chairman Hill? Yes. Staff would record vote as five to zero to zero, and this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to grant. A motion to grant was seconded by Vice Chair John. Also, in support of the motion is Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, Chairman Hill. The motion carries on the vote of five to zero to zero. Okay, thanks, Mr. Moore. Um, when you get a chance again, you can call our first hearing case. All right, this would be case application number 20548 of 1409th Street Northwest LLC. This, uh, Mr. Chairman, is an application as amended for special exceptions from the strike that. This is an application as amended. Uh, self certified application for special exceptions pursuant to subtitle X, section 901.2 from the, from the, from the lot occupancy restrictions of subtitle G, section 404.1 pursuant to subtitle G, section 409.1, subtitle X, section 901.2, rare yard requirements, subtitle G. Section 405.2 pursuant to subtitle G, section 1201, and subtitle X, section 901.2, and minimum parking requirements, subtitle C, section 701.5 pursuant to subtitle C, 
Section 703.2 in Subtitle X, Section 901.2, this would construct a four-story and rare addition to an existing two-story semi-detached mixed-use building in the MU4 zone. Property is located at 400, or rather 1400 Ninth Street, Northwest Square, 0366, Lot 800. And that's all from me. Okay, one minute, please. Okay, Ms. Ferreira, can you hear me? You're on mute, Ms. Ferreira. Yes, I can hear. Good morning. Good morning. Could you introduce yourself for the record, please? Sure. Katerina Ferreira, uh, Principal at Architectural PLC, representing 1400 LLC, uh, 1400 Ninth Street LLC um, on this case. Okay, Ms. Ferreira, if you could just go ahead and walk us through your client's application as to why you believe you're meeting or your client's meeting the standard for us to grant the relief requested. I got 15 minutes on the clock just so I know where we are, and you can begin whenever you like. Thank you. Ms. Ferreira, do you have a PowerPoint? If not, that's okay. I'm just asking. Um, I could walk through the um drawings that are already on um, the uh, case record. Um, I will go ahead and open those up. Is there something specific you'd like Mr. Young to pull up? Uh, sure, the uh, the um, architectural plans and elevation. Do you know which exhibit that is by any chance? It is exhibit three. Forty-three. Three, 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 three. Okay. I only have one screen today, so I'm a little slower. Mr. Young, are you able to pull up exhibit three? Thank you, Mr. Young. All right, Ms. Ferrer, you can just go ahead. Thank you. Um, I will try to keep it brief and uh, limit my presentation to simply explaining the existing conditions, um, which are really what triggers the request for relief. Um, if we could move to the next page, please. So the building is located at 1409th Street Northwest, uh, is one of the oldest buildings in the Shaw Historic District. And it is comprised of an, an original volume uh, closer to O Street. And uh, in addition, um, on the, the north side um, along um, 9th Street Northwest, uh, which was built at a later date. Currently, um, the existing building occupies nearly 100% of the lot. So that is an existing condition that we have been um, handed, so to speak. Um, there's also no rear yard um, as um, the 
um, building occupies a corner site, a very narrow corner site with no ability to really provide a rear yard. Uh, so that really explains the need for two of the um, uh, special exceptions that we are requested, lot occupancy and um, rear yard. Um, and this is a historic structure in the Shaw Historic District, and we are, are not permitted to demolish the building. Um, what we are proposing is an addition to it on the north side to replace um, the, um, the addition that had been built at some point after the original building construction. Uh, so really, we are uh, maintaining the existing condition as far as uh, lot occupancy and lack of rear yard are concerned. The same goes for parking. There's currently no parking at the site, and that is the third special exception that we are requesting. Uh, given the site conditions, um, there is no possibility of providing um, parking. Um, our project is comprised of, if we could move um, on to the next page, please. Next. <clears throat> Next. The, um, the addition I referred to, um, which is the, the majority of the work that we are proposing on the north side is shown on the, the elevation here, and it is a four story um, volume to replace the existing um, building addition. And there's also a smaller volume um, above the historic structure uh, to the south. Next page, please. Um, floor plans of the building, um, self-explanatory. There are six dwelling units and a retail space. And um, that is all the additional information that I have. I'll be glad to answer any question, board members. Okay, thanks, Ms. Ferrer. Mr. Young, if you could just drop the, thank you so much. Uh, does the board have any questions for the applicant at this point? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to turn to the Office of Planning. Good morning, Chairman Hill and members of the board. I'm Ann Fothergill for the Office of Planning for BCA case 20548. And the Office of Planning reviewed the request for three special exceptions for rear yard, lot occupancy, and parking, and has recommended approval based on the review criteria for rear yard and lot occupancy, they're both subject to specific review criteria for the ME4 zone in subtitle G, section 1200.4. Rear yard also has specific criteria in subtitle G, section 1201.1. And then parking, the criteria are listed in subtitle uh, C, section 703.2. And we uh, found that the application met the review criteria and I'll rest on the record in support of the application and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, Ms. Fothergill, did the Office of Planning get clarification about the trash and the recycling? Oh, uh, no, we had requested that because of the, um, you know, the the, the uh, lot occupancy and that there is no um, space on private property to to uh, put trash and recycling. We we did hope that the applicant could provide further information about how that will be handled for both the retail space and the residential space. Ms. Ferreira, could you answer that question, please? Certainly, um, we have created a trash and recycling storage room uh, within the building uh, so that the um, disposal of those uh, materials will be handled by um, the occupants of the building, but we have provided a space within the building to accommodate it uh, until um, trash collection. Is made. And that's within the current plans that you have there? Yes. Okay, Ms. Fowler, do you have any further questions about that? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Does the board have any questions for the office of planning? Mr. Young, is there Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Uh, could you point to the page that is on in the plan? Uh, sure. If we could pull up the, um, the drawings again. So in the uh, lower level plan, which is at the bottom of the sheet, underneath the stair, you can see there is a, a third door. There's a door to each unit, and then there's a third door to a space underneath the stair. That is our trash storage room. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else for the applicant or the office of planning? 
Mr. Young, is there anyone here wishing to speak? Do not. Ms. Ferreira, how did it go with the ANC? Uh, we have obtained ANC support. Uh, we um, attended a meeting with the Community Development Committee uh, and obtained their support, hence the ANC support as well. And the case was thoroughly reviewed by them, uh, both as part of the DCA um, relief application is also, and also as part of the historic preservation uh, approval process. Okay, so they seem they seemed um, pleased with the project. Yes. Okay, all right, and I saw that HPRB has concept design approval. Is that right? Correct. Okay, all right. Um, anyone else have any questions for anybody? Sure, go ahead, Mr. Blake. Uh, there was one question with regard to installing a short-term bike rack in public space. Have you had some discussion about that? I saw that noted on the uh, OP report, and that is something that we will take on later in the comp. Okay. On the, on the D dot report, but apologies, I may have misspoken. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Young. I asked if anybody was here to speak, right? And you said no. Correct. Okay, Vice Chair John, you had your hand up. So there's an NC report, easier case number 20548, but it's um, 1631 13th Street at Exhibit 41. Um, and it, it's in support, but the case, the number of the, the, the address is not the same. Um, this property is at 1409th Street. Um, Ms. Ferreira, can you take a look at Exhibit 2F? Oh, I'm sorry, Exhibit 41. Uh, was yes, I have seven, seen seven. the letter from the ANC. Um, It's the correct um, case number, but it's for 1631. Yeah, I think they, they, the address is shown incorrectly, although the relief appears to be correct. Um, and the case number is correct. So okay. I think it's a clerical error. All right. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Vice Chair John. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing and the record. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I would just ask that we may reach out to the ANC and ask them to just correct the address. It's real simple for the record, I believe, because everything else matches is just the address. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Moy, could you do that, please? Uh, yes, yeah, so I can follow up with that. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean the the relief the case number is correct, the relief is correct. So I think again, it was kind of a, cl a clerical error that we might as well clarify for the record. Um, since I've been talking for the past hour, would somebody else like to start talking? I'll raise your hand for that. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Smith. Oh, no, go ahead, Vice Chair John. I'm just I'm just wanting somebody else to start deliberation. Did I hear you start, Mr. Smith? Okay, so I, I thought this case was fairly straightforward. And um, in view of the fact that um, it's um, in the Shaw Historic District, I thought that the applicant has done a good job of uh, working with those limitations. And um, I'm gonna give great weight to the report of the Office of Planning in terms of how the application meets the criteria for relief. And I know, noticed that DDOT is in support and we um, also have a report from NC um, 6F that will be corrected. And um, I don't have anything further to add. I should also say I, I will give great weight to the re recommendations of, or the issues and concerns of NC2F, and in this case, they had none. 
So I would be in support of the application. Thank you, Vice Chair John. Mr. Smith? I agree with the analysis of uh, Vice Chair John. I do believe that the applicant has met um, the burden of proof for us to be able to grant the uh, special exceptions for law occupancy and uh, from the uh, rear yard requirements and uh, minimum parking standards in the zone. Uh, I, from the standpoint of parking, um, I do believe that the um, site is sufficiently served by um, multimodal transportation options. Um, um, I, I don't believe that parking would really be necessary at the site. Um, also, uh, given the lot occupancy uh, special exception, I think the size and scale of the building is larger than character than what we currently see there. Um, it's fairly modest in comparison to the convention center, which is uh, not too far away from this particular property. Um, so, uh, with that, I give great weight to uh, OP staff report. Note that the ANC is in support of this application, and I will also um, uh, be in support. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Blake? Yes, I too would be in support uh, of the application. It does seem to have uh, met the burden of proof uh, to be granted relief. Um, it uh, certainly meets the requirements for parking. The applicant has identified six of the, of the 10 potential requirements of step C703.2, uh, where only one is required. Um, so I think based on the evaluation of the specific criteria, the applicant has demonstrated uh, that the proposed addition uh, will not tend to firstly affect the neighboring property and will be in harmony with the zoning regulations. Um, I'd be prepared to support as well. Thank you, Chairman Hood. I would also agree uh, this, both subtitle G was required in this case had been met as well as subtitle C has already been so noted. And I, I agree with um, leaving it open, not necessarily open, but getting the correction of ANC 2F um, uh, letter for the address. Other than that, I think it, it, it warrants uh, approval of this case. And I think it's an improvement. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Head. Okay, I have nothing else to add. And I will agree with all of the comments from my colleagues. I'm going to make a motion to approve application number 20548 as captioned read by the secretary and ask for a second, Ms. John. Okay. Motion made and second, Mr. Moore. If you could uh, again um, take a roll call and then just leave the record open for an adjustment from the ANC on the address to their report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief requested. The motion was seconded by Vice Chair John. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Blake? Yes. Vice Chair John? Yes. Chairman Hill? Yes. Staff would record the vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve, seconded by Vice Chair John. Also in support of the motion to approve is Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, Chairman Hill. Motion carries on a vote of five to zero to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Uh, we're just moving along here today, so feel free to call the next one when you get a moment. All right, the next case application before the board is number 20566 of AT&T. This is a self-certified application for special exception under subtitle C, section 1313 for to raise an existing monopole and construct a new monopole in the R1B zone. The property is located at 1800. Perry Street, P-E-R-R-Y, Northeast Square, 157, Lot 26. And, and I think I've said everything I need to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Ms. Giordano, can you hear us? Can you hear me? This is Cynthia Giordano from Saul Ewing Law Firm. I'm going to defer to my colleague, uh, Doug Sampson, on this project. Okay, thanks, Ms. Giordano. 
I'm looking for Mr. Sampson. Mr. Sampson, can you hear me? I don't see a square for you. Oh, there we go. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hi, good uh, morning, everyone. Good morning. Could you introduce yourself for the record, please? Yes, my name is Doug Sampson from the law firm of Saul Ewing, Arnstein, and Lear here on behalf of the applicants AT&T and the DC Department of General Services. Okay, Mr. Sampson, if you wanna go ahead and give us your presentation as to why you believe your client is meeting the standard for us to grant the relief requested, I'm gonna put 15 minutes on the clock just there so, there so I know where we are and you can begin whenever you like. Great, and thank you very much to the members of the board for your time and consideration today. Um, I do have several team members on the call with me, but uh, unless you have specific questions for them for efficiency, I'll proffer that their testimony would reflect the application materials um, and we'd stand on the record. I do have um, a couple of visuals. If you would like to see them, coverage maps, photo simulations, um, just let me know. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Sampson. Just ask ask Mr. Young to pull up whatever you would like to take a look at in order to explain. Okay, I, I if if I'm able to share my screen, I actually have them uh, available. You can't, you can't share your screen, yeah. Is there anything okay. in the record you can point us to? Uh, sure. So the uh, the photo simulations of the facility would be uh, most helpful. They're Exhibit Nine to our justification statement. I don't know if they're renumbered something else in the system. I can double check that. Exhibit nine, your statement of intended use. Uh, no, the the, uh, the statement of justification that we submitted, uh, which is that exhibit eight. You know what? Color color photograph exhibit number five. That would be that would probably be the most helpful for the group. Got it. You said exhibit five, right, Mr. Sampson? Yes, I believe those were the, the color photographs, the I, photo renderings of this. Okay, got it. Yep, there we go. Um, so this is an application for a special exception for a, a wireless telecommunications facility at the Dwight A. Mosley Sports Complex. And what you're seeing on your screen is, is a photo rendering of uh, up to the left there, you have a satellite view showing generally where this would be located. Down in the bottom left is an existing view and then the proposed view. And so this is what we call a drop and swap. Um, this is taking an eight, existing 80 foot stadium light pole that has field lights on it and replacing it with an 85 foot telecommunications pole. So the lights will be replaced back on the new pole and then AT&T will place the telecommunications antennas above those lights to bring in, uh, you know, emergency and non-emergency wireless and broadband services to the area. Um, AT&T has identified a significant gap in coverage affecting the North Michigan Park, Brooklyn, and Woodridge neighborhoods that this facility would fill in that coverage gap. And because we're replacing an already existing light pole, and if you want to go to the next view, you, you get a little bit closer view of, of the pole itself. Uh, because we're replacing the existing light pole, there's no adverse impact on the neighborhood. And the Office of Planning agreed with us in their recommendation report. Um, that there would be no adverse visual impact. And so the real benefit of, of doing it this way is you're adding telecommunication facility and services to the area without creating any new infrastructure or new monopoles uh, in the neighborhood. And um, this is a heavy residential area. And so uh, we worked with the city and AT&T to, to find a way to bring services to that residential area without impacting the neighborhood. Um, the other thing that this facility brings that I want to highlight is something called FirstNet. So if you're not familiar with FirstNet, it was created following it by the 9-11 Commission with U.S. Congress. 
So following the September 11th attacks uh, where the wireless networks were jammed up and nobody could, could coordinate with first responders because of problems with the cellular network, Congress created FirstNet to be a dedicated broad, uh, broadband network specifically for first responders to prevent that from ever happening again. And the federal government entered into an exclusive contract with AT&T. This service is offered wherever there's adequate service for AT&T. And so this will be a first net site. We've actually worked with the District of Columbia um, who opted into the program in 2017. Um, they identified this specific area as a place they wanted to bring first net. Um, and a, a number of, of local and federal agencies use this. And they're, during COVID, we've really seen it explode where there've been up to 1.5 million connections a day using first net by first responders across the country. Um, so we think that's a real benefit to this community. Um, the Office of Planning has given us a recommendation. We received a unanimous recommendation from ANC 5B after two meetings with them. Uh, we also have a positive report from DDOT. So uh, with that, we'd stand on our application and ask that this honorable board approve our special exception. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. Does the board have any questions for Mr. Sampson? Chairman Hood? Thank you, uh, Mr. Sampson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sampson, for your uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Sampson, I have one or two questions. Um, were you around when the Zonal Commission dealt with the antenna regulations here in the District of Columbia? Um, I don't know if I, I'm familiar with those, no. Okay, okay, so I won't go down that line. I, I was just wondering if some of the risk factors have changed, but I, I don't want to bring that up because that was vetted well at that time and we had a lot of uh, experts come in to testify so I'll, I'll just leave that alone I, I will say that um going between and i'm glad to see that <clears throat> actually this action is taking place but because going between 18th and south dakota and 18th and monroe you don't even get a signal and i'm glad to see that this is going to so so this will probably solve that problem um so i'm glad to see that you all work i don't necessarily have a comment i mean a, a question but I'm glad to see that that's happening. I want you to know every time I lose my uh, call, when I go through that, I'm be thinking of you, Mr. Sampson, if I still <laughs> lose it once we get started. So that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Chairman. Anyone else for Mr. Sampson? Um, Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Sampson, Mr. Sampson, can you go over briefly how your project meets the criteria for C-13? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, Really, the, the important thing, I think, when you're looking at the criteria in, in C-13 um, is, you know, is this, you know, for one thing, is this designed for co-location by other service providers? This does have RAD centers. We call them RAD centers. That's, that's uh, height above ground um, areas for uh, other telecommunications providers to co-locate their antennas. And we did make this poll available for two additional providers. Um, to co-locate on this poll. So hopefully it won't help just AT&T providers, but also uh, also some other wireless uh, providers can co-locate co there as well. Um, as I stated, this really does minimize the visual impacts to the greatest practical extent by not creating a new monopole or a new facility. It, it simply replaces an existing light pole that's just five feet taller to, to accommodate the antennas. Um, there's really not a lot of trees in the area as far as um, you know, preserving the existing trees. So there, no tree removal will be required uh, for this particular uh, facility. Um, and as, as uh, the previous chairman mentioned, there is a significant gap in coverage here and those maps are included um, as part of our application materials. And it's a, it's a very specific hole. Um, and if you look at those maps there, the green coverage shows full AT&T service, including in-building coverage and in-car coverage. And so that's what we consider complete service because you're driving through an area and you lose your lose your call. I mean, what if that's an emergency situation and you lose that call and drop that call? So um, there is a very significant gap in that area and this pole um, would be actually almost dead center in that and will really fill in that gap and, and fill in the gap in the coverage. Um, we have provided uh, other locations, other AT&T facilities and other locations within a two mile radius as required by the code. Um, the two, closest uh, poles uh, were just not feasible options. They were too far outside of this coverage area. And um, the Office of Planning mentioned that there was a, a flagpole um, telecommunications facility. And the difficulty with that one is there's not enough space for AT&T to locate its antennas. And 
again, it's not ideal, even if there was, to, to fill in the existing coverage gap. Um, so we believe that this is the least intrusive means to bring the coverage uh, that's needed to the area um, while just replacing this tower, it, 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 replacing this existing light pole. Um, it is in compliance with the Height Act. We worked with, uh, with the DC Office of Planning before putting this application in. Um, we initially discuss, discussed having a waiver to try to go higher and decided it would be best for the community to, to not try to get a waiver of the Height Act and simply increase this pole by 500 feet. Um, we meet the required setbacks. We're more than 200 feet away from the closest residential property. Um, we're beyond the one-to-one -one setback ratio. And, uh, and again, I, I, this, this will bring needed emergency and non-emergency services to the area. Um, so if there's anything I missed that you'd like me to touch on specifically, um, we, we believe that this is in compliance and the Office of Planning agrees. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. Thank you. Okay, anyone else for Mr. Sampson before I turn to the Office of Planning? All right, I'm turning to the Office of Planning. Yes, um, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, board, Karen Thomas with the Office of Planning. And the Office of Planning um, noted that the applicant did satisfy the criteria of Section 1313. Um, and um, based on uh, the special exception uh, requirements, we think that the uh, proposed conversion of the light and monopole uh, to be used as a monopole for AT&T would satisfy, um, would be in harmony with the intent and um, purpose of the zoning regulations, um, particularly as it permits co-location of other uh, two other carriers. And it would not be appreciably different from uh, existing light poles in the area. Uh, again, um, we worked with the, with the applicant to um, stay within um, the height and not exceed the um, high tax for that area. Um, so um, we don't think it would uh, tend to adversely affect um, the use of neighboring property. It's on a plain field um, and it's appreciably diff uh, distant from you know residential properties. One thing I um, just it's not in our report and I just like to bring up is that. With respect to the coverage issues, um, and I know the district is concerned with equity. Now, this is this is an equitable, I would say, an equitable um, provision for district residents because a lot, the, the pandemic um, opened up a lot of issues with coverage, and we saw that neighborhoods, particularly um, neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods. And people of neighborhoods with people of color, they did not have sufficient access to wireless um, capacity. So this is going to satisfy a much needed um, a much needed service for areas where there's low coverage capacity. And I'll rest on the record of um, my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Does the board have any questions for the Office of Planning? Chairman Hood? Oh, Ms. Thomas, I, I don't have any questions, but I want to commend you for making that nexus with the racial equity piece in this case, Ms. Ms. Thomas. I, I really appreciate uh, you bringing that to the foresight and also putting that on the record because I think, I think it's well said and I think you're absolutely correct. So thank you for putting that on the record. Does anyone else have any questions for the Office of Planning? Does the applicant have any questions for the Office of Planning? No. Mr. Young, is there anyone here wishing to speak? We do not. All right. Does anybody have anything final to add? Mr. Sampson, do you have anything final to add? I would just echo what, what Ms. Thomas said at the end there. Um, AT&T during the pandemic found that at times its network capacity increased by 40% nationwide. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we're really targeting, you know, moving forward is knowing that we're living in a different world with, you know, virtual meetings like this, virtual schooling, a virtual worship, all those possibilities. Um, you know, so that, that is something that, it, that is, we are trying to reach out to areas that are underserved and don't have adequate services. Um, because we did see that the effects, as she said, during the pandemic on certain areas. And so uh, I, I just echo what she says and, and couldn't agree more. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing on the record. Mr. Young, if you could please excuse everyone.
Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, with regard to this particular case, I mean, I thought it was pretty well after hearing after even the hearing, I've learned a lot more. And also, I think that it's more straightforward in terms of um, I think they are meeting the criteria and I do thank uh, Vice Chair John for asking uh, the applicant to go over a little bit more uh, concerning the standards. I thought that the uh, the fact, well, first of all, the analysis of the Office of Planning, I would agree with that. I would also agree with the um, uh, report from ANC 5B in terms of that they had no issues or concerns. I mean, this is actually a pretty relatively straightforward one in terms of we see monopoles a lot and that, you know, they, they're basically taking a light pole that's already there on a field and adding five feet to it, which is still not to exceed the height act. And then also since it is, as the Office of Planning had pointed out, a co-locate, a co-location, co-locator, co-location, like other other people can, you know, jump onto that as well. Um, and then I learned about FirstNet, which I hadn't actually learned about. So that was good. And then I also would um, uh, agree with the comments that both the Office of Planning made as well as Chairman Hood concerning coverage equity in terms of uh, different areas in the city that due to the pandemic as well as um, just normal life, you know, they need to have, um, uh, the, they deserve, everyone deserves the same cellular college coverage as everyone else. So I didn't have any issues with this and I'm going to be voting in favor. Mr. Smith. Um, um, Chairman Hill, I largely agree with your analysis as, as far as, um, um, uh, communications, uh, towers go, uh, this one is fairly, uh, straightforward and I do believe that applicant has. Uh, sufficiently, um, you know, has, has, has found a site within the district and propo has proposed a communications tower that um, attempts to minimize any adverse impacts um, by locating it all within a park um, on an existing monopole type space, such as a you know a light for a small field hill here, and they're adding. In addition, five feet. I will also say that um, their communications equipment, they are uh, sufficiently screening it uh, with uh, you know, a six foot fence with um, uh, striping to hide the equipment and also some landscaping around that. Um, so uh, it blends in with the uh, surrounding landscape there at the park. Um, so, uh, with that, again, I agree with your analysis and. Um, um, OP's analysis of this particular case, and I will uh, vote in support. Thank you, Vice Chair John. I thought um, the this was fairly straightforward, and I really thank the applicant for um, for stepping us through how the the application meets the criteria for relief under C thirteen thirteen. And I really have nothing more to add to the analysis so far, and. I'm in support of the application. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Yes, I too believe the applicant has met the burden of proof uh, to be granted to request relief. Um, I credit the applicant uh, and the Office of Planning's analysis, uh, to which I give great weight in the assessment and satisfaction of the numerous uh, specific conditions of uh, C1313. Uh, importantly, I would also note that the site will fill an, an existing gap in coverage, which, as we talked about, is very important. Um, and it also will provide the co-location opportunities for other providers. So I also think that the general conditions, general conditions have also been met um, with this and uh, would be prepared to support. Thank you. Chairman Hood. I did as already stated, I think they have covered subtitle uh, C 13.2. Uh, 13 and if I say any more, I would just be redundant and want to hear myself talk. So I would concur with all of my colleagues. All right, thanks, Chairman Hood. All right, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve application number 20566 as captioned and read by the secretary and ask for a second, Ms. John. Second. Motion made and seconded, Mr. Moore. If you take a roll call. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief requested the motion was seconded by, by by excuse me the motion was seconded by vice chair john zoning commission chair anthony hood yes mr smith yes mr blake yes vice chair john 
Yes. Chairman Hill. Yes. Step would record vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve. Motion seconded by Vice Chair John also in support of the motion to approve. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, and Chairman Hill. Motion carries, sir, in the vote of five to zero to zero. Okay, thanks, Mr. Moy. Okay, well, without jinxing myself by saying this, and I don't even know if jinxing, I don't know where jinx came from. That like uh, we seem like we're moving along smoothly. Do we want to do one more case and then take a break, or do we want to take a break now? Miss John had something she said. Now, if you don't mind. Yep. Okay. Let's take a break. Thank okay. you. Then uh, we'll come back in like 10, 15 minutes. Thank you.
I always get confused. I don't know whether to come back at the 10 minutes or come back at the 15 minutes. Thank you on mute, Mr. Chairman. Am I on mute or are you on mute? No, I'm on mute. Oh, okay. I said I don't know either, Chairman Hood. We're no longer live in the in the in the same building. So, you know, it was much easier in the same building. Yeah. I mean, how do you guys do it at the ZC? I either say 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I see. <laughs> I don't say 10 or 15 because I don't know which one to do. <laughs> we're we, we're a little bit more flexible over here, Chairman Head. Oh, okay. I understand. So right. I could I could choose to come back in 10 minutes or choose 15. Well, what I think is that uh Commissioner May puts his camera on when he's back. And so that's <laughs> okay. that's what I now have started to do. I just, you know, when I'm back, then when everybody's back, they put on their cameras and then oh. When everybody's camera's back, then we're back. Okay, okay. All right, I understand how it works now. Thank you for that clarification. And com Commissioner Hood, 10 to 15 minutes um, means that 12 minutes is okay. Just saying. Okay. But thank you. I I'll follow it. I'll just sit here. I'll come back at 10 and wait. Okay. Well, you can you can put on your camera, Chairman. That's that's when that means you're back. You know. Oh. And, okay. And, and sometimes you know, fifteen could be twenty. It just it's it's, you know. I'm going to end that conversation right there. <laughs> <sighs> All right. We're all back. Mr. Moy, you can call our next case if you're there. All right, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, board is back in its hearing session after a quick break, and the time is at or about 1056 in the morning. The next case application before the board is case application number 20571 of Verizon Wireless. And this is a self-certified application for a special exception under subtitle C, section 1313.2, um, pursuant to subtitle X, section 901.2. This would construct a new monopole. I believe it's a temporary monopole for 18 months in the RA1 zone. And it is located or would be located at address 700 Yuma Street, Southeast Square, 6124, lots 47, 808, and 809. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you, Mr. Moore. Ms. Huddlecox, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Could you introduce yourself for the record, please? Megan Huddlecox with Goulston and Stores on behalf of the applicant. Great. Ms. Huddlecox, if you want to go ahead and walk us through your client's application as to why you believe they're meeting the standard for us to grant the relief requested, I'm going to put 15 minutes on the clock just so that I know where we are. And if there's any particular exhibit you'd like us to refer to, please let us know and you can begin whenever you like. Thank you very much. Good morning again. For the record, my name is Megan Huddlecox and I, along with my colleague, Christine Roddy, are with Goulston and Stores representing the applicant in this case. We are here on behalf of Verizon Wireless and NBNC Consulting, Verizon's agent, asking for special exception approval for a temporary monopole at 700 Yuma Street Southeast. Verizon currently has antennas located on Farabee Recreation Center, which is being demolished this year to make way for new improvements. We're proposing to place this temporary monopole on the edge of the campus for 18 months in a location that won't be disturbed by the construction activity. After construction, Verizon will pursue permanent antennas in place of the temporary monopole. The temporary antenna is needed at this location to maintain coverage and service to the Congress Heights community. Without such a temporary antenna, the coverage for this area would be severely impacted and emergency services would be harmed. The proposed monopole will be 72 feet tall, roughly the same height as the existing antennas, which is the minimum height needed to maintain coverage in this area. The monopole will be located in the southwest corner of the site, buffered from all neighboring properties by public streets. 
The property is located in the RA1 zone, which necessitates this special exception approval from the board. As demonstrated in our initial and supplemental filings, the application meets all of the requirements of Subtitle C, Section 1312 and 1313 for special exception approval, with one exception. The regulations would require a 24-foot setback from all property lines. Instead, we are proposing a 13-foot, 10-inch setback from the south property line to the monopole. However, the monopole is buffered by Yuma Street to the south, which is 80 feet wide, providing ample space between the monopole and any adjacent properties. In addition to the specific materials required and standards set forth in Subtitle C, Chapter 13, the proposal also meets the general special exception standards. The application is in harmony with the purpose and intent of the regulations as the proposal meets all of the requirements except for the one setback I mentioned, but that is mitigated by the public street buffer between the monopole and the nearest property. The monopole also will not adversely affect neighboring properties, but will instead provide important connectivity for the community while minimizing visual impacts through construction site screening and a greater than one-to-one -one setback from all adjacent properties. Before turning to our presentation, I am happy to report that we are here today with the support of the Office of Planning and a report of no objection from the District Department of Transportation. Additionally, ANCAE submitted a report in support in the record for the monopole. We greatly appreciate the ANC's time working with us on this project. With that, we have one witness today. Shell Beltran with NBNC Consulting will provide greater detail on the need for the temporary monopole and what it will look like on the site. Paul, could you please bring up the presentation that we submitted and I'll turn it over to Shay. Mr. Beltran, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, could you introduce yourself for the record, please? My name is Shay Beltran with Network Building and Consulting representing Verizon Wireless. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, if you could uh, proceed to the next slide. Uh, as Ms. Uh, Huddle-Cox explained, Verizon currently has 12 antennas uh, installed on the roof of the Fairview Hope Rec Center. Uh, that building is scheduled to be demolished uh, in the coming months. Uh, those antennas currently serve uh, and provide coverage to the Washington Highlands and Congress Heights area. Um, since that building is scheduled to be demolished, uh, Verizon needs to implement a uh, temporary monopole immediately so that we do not lose service uh, to the community um, as well as uh, emergency services. Um, Due to this being an active construction site, as was explained earlier, uh, our options uh, as far as locations go on the parcel are limited. Uh, we selected, uh, I'm sorry, if you could go to the next slide, please. So that red X on the right side over the Fairview Hope Rec Center is where the existing uh, antennas are, and then the left side is where the proposed temporary monopole is. That is the least intrusive uh, spot to the un, uh, current construction that is undergoing. And if you could go to the next slide. This is the, an outline of our site plan that uh, shows the proposed work. Uh, we found a section of the parcel that is most suitable for Verizon as well as the construction company that doesn't interfere with any of the existing work. And if you could proceed to the next slide. This uh, shows our uh, propagation maps on the left side illustrates the coverage. Uh, if these uh, antennas were not to be replaced after the building was demolished, the red is where uh, Verizon is providing service and the non-colored areas are where uh, there is lack of service. And on the right side is uh, Verizon's coverage with this uh, proposed temporary monopole. Uh, as I mentioned before, the terrain of the surrounding area and the neighborhood make it difficult for uh, Verizon RF engineers to find a suitable location that is not on site. Uh, we would very much like to remain on the existing parcel. Um, we are also continuing to search for a suitable permanent location, um, but this temporary solution needs to be deployed immediately so that we do not uh, lose service in the area. Uh, we have 
been in discussion with uh, DC government as well as Homeland Security who have uh, supported this uh, installment. Uh, there are multiple agencies that have come out in support that have illustrated uh, the need for this service here. Uh, this, uh, the, this site handles uh, 911 calls in the area, of uh, Metro PD, DC Fire and Emergency Services, uh, et cetera, all have expressed that this is a uh, important location for Verizon and we they would be um, negatively impacted if these antennas were to be uh, removed. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. I've got a series of photo simulations that would illustrate uh, what this proposed temporary monopole would look like. Uh, the red dots are the location that the photo was taken from and the star is where the site is. If you could go to the next slide, please. This shows the existing uh, site without the tower. This is taken uh, from the corner of Conan Terrace and Yuma. And if you go to the next slide, and that is the proposed uh, temporary monocle from that same location. Next slide, please. Uh, that is uh, existing, and I cannot, one second, I cannot read from that small. This is from the Northwest, uh, from the Paramount Baptist Church parking lot. If you go to the next slide, and that is what the proposed antenna will look like from there. Next slide, please. That is from 4th Street Southeast. Uh, the site would not be visible from uh, this location from the Southwest. Next slide, please. That is our view from the Southwest from uh, the Highland Dwelling Public Housing. And next slide, please. That is the pre proposed uh, view of what this monopole would look like from that location. Next slide. As existing from the Northwest uh, Xenia Street and 8th Street Southeast. Next slide, please. And that is the proposed, as you can see, it would be uh, hardly visible uh, on the horizon over there. Next slide, please. And that is the proposed from uh, 8th Street and Yuma Street Southeast. You can see it in the distance uh, on the street there, over the street, rather. Next slide, please. That is the existing from the southeast on Yuma Street. Next slide. And that is the proposed from Yuma. And next slide. This is existing from Condon Terrace Southeast. And the next slide is the proposed. And next slide is the existing from Condon Terrace uh, from the Northeast. And the next slide is the proposed. And that's all I have. Uh, I, we are uh, free to take any questions or I can turn it back over to Ms. Hottlecox. Thanks so much. That concludes our presentation, um, but we're happy to answer any questions that the commission that the board might have. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Hunnicox. Does the board have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Blake? Yes, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is you mentioned that it's a temporary solution for 18 months. Do you have confidence that 18 months is long enough for the construction project and for you to find an uh, alternative site. And it would seem that you would look to put the new antenna site within the new complex of the, the, the recreation center. Is that the case? But you indicated it's it almost like it's not sure that it would. Is that just because it hasn't been negotiated? There are a couple of options that we are looking at, one of which would be uh, a security pole, uh, existing security pole that will be built on the uh, complex, uh, which will house uh, security cameras. Um, we have explored other options, uh, including um, 
some existing apartment buildings around the area that just do not meet the Verizon wireless coverage needs, we would very much like to remain on the parcel to uh, provide the uh, least change in coverage, uh, uh, basically just keep the same amount of coverage that Verizon has now. Um, there is also, we are exploring the option of installing on the roof of the new rec center, uh, but I know that there are some difficulties involved with that as the, the roof is uh, proposed to be a green roof. And on the timing? Yeah, we are confident that we could have something deployed within 18 months. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, turning the office planning. Yes, um, good morning, Mr. Chair again, Karen Thomas with the Office of Planning, and we are in support of, of this application for a temporary installation at this time. We um, are satisfied that the applicant presented uh, a good, made a good case to us uh, for this. Um, we had worked with them on it and they really didn't have any other solution at the time. We also, again, uh, think that they meet, they satisfy the special exception criteria and where they did not meet the um, setback, the required setback, we would accept the waiver. It's a construction site. Um, there, there would be no place to locate such a temporary um, installation on a full construction site. And um, so it's, it's mitigated by the width of the street as well from the closest resident. Uh, also, um, it would advance the neighborhood's uh, maintenance of its connectivity to Wi-Fi. And again, I would just note that from a position of equity, a lot of kids in these neighborhoods, while I don't have exact documentation, they use hotspots to access the internet. Um, and, and, and they don't have um, Wi-Fi capacity. So they use, actually use their phones to connect to their computers using hotspots to do that. And if you look at the propagation maps, you would see a significant drop in, in connectivity for these neighborhoods, which are typically low-income neighborhoods. So we would um, stand in support of this um, temporary installation and hope that they do get um, proper installation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Does anybody have any questions for the Office of Planning? Chairman Hood? I'm just going to echo my comments again, uh, Ms. Thomas. I thank you again for again making that connection with the racial equity lens uh, in this case, because I think it's applicable and it really applies here as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hood. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for the Office of Planning? Ms. Huddle Cox, do you have any questions for the Office of Planning? No, thank you. Mr. Young, is there anyone here wishing to speak? We do not. Okay. Um, let's see. Ms. Huddle Cox, is there anything you'd like to add at the end? No, thank you so much for your time today. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing and the record. Mr. Young, if you could please excuse everyone. Would anyone like to start deliberating? So I'll, I'll get the um, discussion started. I I thought the applicant has shown the um, necessity for um, the, the temporary monaco, so that's not an issue. And in terms of how the application meets the criteria of 1313.2, I believe that both the applicant's presentation and the Office of Planning's report and presentation show how the application meets the criteria and in, in particular, how um, the applicant is, is um, um, qualifies for relief from the, um, the location of the the uh, um, temporary monopole, which does not meet the 20-foot um, um, criteria, 
or the distance criteria, which is one third of the total constructed height. And as the Office of Planning noted that um, this, this um, shortened distance is mitigated by Yuma Street. So it would, um, would um, you know, not create such an adverse impact on the residential properties. So I would start the discussion there and um, I will be in support of the application. Thank you, Vice Chair John. Mr. Smith? I agree with Vice Chair John's analysis of this particular case. I think the applicant has sufficiently demonstrated to us uh, the degree um, uh, for the request uh, for relief for this temporary um, facility, as, as we John stated, and the applicant stated, and um, the Officer OB, Officer Planning stated within their uh, staff report, while this, this uh, temporary structure doesn't meet the setback requirements, um, that is mitigated by uh, the width of the new street um, at this site, and also, I would say, given the location, um, uh, topography is also a benefit here because the south side of the new street is is higher, so um, it wouldn't be as this particular structure wouldn't be as imposing as it otherwise would be, um, uh, given the topography of the site. Um, um, other than that, I you know get up, I stand on OP's um, on the stand the board. Um, I do believe they've met the burden of proof. Um, I will support the application um, with the condition uh, that uh, 18 months, I think it's 18 months, yep. temporary installation is for a period of 18 months from the effective date of the board. So uh, I will support. Thanks, Mr. Smith. And I was going to mention that when I get there to the end, right? This is I'm also in support of the the condition that the Office of Planning had recommended that this wouldn't um, the 18 months wouldn't start until the date that the order was issued, so that they have the 18 months to do what they're supposed to do or trying to do. Um, Mr. Blake, yeah, uh, the applicant has demonstrated that the location is the only viable location for the temporary installation. That will allow it to main coverage, uh, maintain coverage, and it doesn't adversely impact the neighboring properties and won't be in the way of the active construction site. Um, reviewing the facts of the record, the applicant has demonstrated compliance with C1313A through G and has met the burden of proof to be granted uh, special exception relief. I give great weight to the Office of Planning's analysis and recommendation, um, which again would approve the temporary installation for a period of 18 months with the effective date of the order. Uh, I note that DDOT has no objections and the ANC E voted in support of having uh, a, a support with no issues of concern stated. Um, and there are also no issues of opposition from neighbors and I'm prepared to support the relief request for relief. Thank you. Chairman Hood. I don't have anything to add, uh, Mr. Chairman, other than to add on again the piece with the record racial equity uh, again is mentioned uh, by the Office of Plan. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hood. Yeah, I also would agree with your comments again about uh, equity in terms of the neighborhood and availability to access of uh, Wi-Fi broadband and even uh, the hotspots that um, the Office of Planning mentioned. Um, I'm comfortable that the fact that there's a public street buffer from that side that is not the uh, setback requirements. And I'm also comfortable with the 18 months uh, for the order um, that the time starting after the order is issued. Um, after that, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. So I'm going to make a motion to approve application number 20571 as captioned read by the secretary, including the condition that the 18th month period begin after the order is issued and ask for a second, Ms. John. Second. The motion was made and second, Mr. Moy, if you take a roll call. When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief requested, along with the one condition as the chairman has cited in his motion. The motion was seconded by Vice Chair John. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Blake? Yes. Vice Chair John? Yes. Chairman Hill? Yes. 
staff would record the vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hood, I ra rather Chairman Hill to approve. Seconded by Vice Chair John. And uh, of course, also in support of the motion to approve is Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, Chairman Hill. Uh, staff would record vote as five to zero to zero. The motion carries, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Uh, Mr. Moy, you can feel free when you get a chance to call our next one. The next case application is number 20574 of Bonnie Gow and Michael Consilvio. And this is this is as amended a self-certified application for special exception from the lot occupancy requirements of subtitle E section 304.1. Mm, pursuant to subtitle E section 5201 and subtitle X section 901.2. This would construct a new detached one story accessory garage in the RF1 zone. Property is located at two at 237 8th Street Southeast Square 900 lot 810. That's all for me, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Mr. Romero, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Could you introduce yourself for the record, please? Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Michael Romero with Romero Architects. On behalf of Mr. Michael Concilio, Concilio and Ms. Bonnie Guo, the owners of 237 8th Street North, uh, Southeast. Okay. Ms. Romero, if you could just walk us through your client's application as to why you believe they're meeting the criteria for us to grant the requested relief. I'm going to put 15 minutes on the clock there so I know where we are. If there's something you'd like us to pull up, please let us know and you can begin whenever you like. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. Can you please pull up exhibit number 41, applicant's PowerPoint presentation? Thank you. Um, we are uh, here today to ask for a step special exception to allow a detached accessory garage in the RF1 district. Lot occupancy allows for a maximum of 60% lot occupancy, the existing 55.9, and we are asking to go to 69.9. Um, the location, uh, the, the property is located on the uh, west side of 8th Street, he, as you can see here. Please, next slide. Um, as you can see um, in this more close slide, the, most of the properties on the east side, on the west side of 8th Street, um, have a garage, and uh, we are asking for a special exception to, to do the same. Next slide, please. As you can see from the following photos, um, the, uh, the, the existing property does not have a garage and it's actually a dark spot in this alley uh, to the west. On the western side of the alley is commercial properties and then one um, uh, ha residential property with a garage. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we are asking for uh, the um, the ability to construct a garage similar to the ones that uh, our neighbors have done. Um, when we initially um, submitted for this relief, we we uh, we we hit with a full garage uh, width, the full width garage, a full depth garage uh, above the 70 percent, and, and through communications with specifically the Capitol Hill Restoration Society. And then subsequently, the ANC's Planning and Zoning Committee, uh, we were recommended, and we took their advice to go to uh, to reduce the footprint of the garage to be able to be here today to ask for a special special exception. Um, and um, in the um, in the in the case record, um, you'll find um, a, a letter of opposition from the um, CHRS um, with the previous. Um, uh, idea uh, opposed, uh, but in the letter it says that they would be they would be open to a, uh, a special exception application. So uh, we've amended accordingly. So we have a full depth one car space and then uh, room for storage. But on, on from the alley, it would appear a full 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 width garage similar to the neighbors. Um, the um, 
So uh, you'll, uh, in terms of communication, um, we have um, uh, the, the owners have have solicited and, and received uh, letters of support from both neighbors on either side, and one from two houses down. And I'd like to uh, respectfully ask for con for consideration to submit those to the records today. Um, uh, it is it is uh, uh, um, uh, in support on on both sides and one uh, two two doors down. Mr. Um, Romero, are they not in the record now? Correct. Correct. And that is my mistake. Um, I was under the impression that I could do it and later than I thought that I could. And I, I respectfully uh, ask uh, that they uh, be put into the record. Sure. The letters of support are on either adjacent side. You have two letters or three letters? Three letters on both sides, uh, 235 and uh, 239. And then a, a third one of 233, which is two doors down from the subject property. Okay. So unless the board has any issues, I'd like to let those into the record. And if someone does have an issue, please speak up. All right, Mr. Romero, we're going to add those into the record. Please continue. Uh, that is all I have for today. I'm happy to um, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. All right, does the board have any questions for the applicant? Everyone. Mr. Smith? Okay, so. Um... We have a letter in the record uh, from um, CHRS uh, for opposition. That was because you originally requested a variance. We have a, we have a revised application for us, uh, an application for a special exception. Um, did you take this back to CHRS uh, for their comment and review? I did not. I'm sorry. Uh, what what happened was basically I, I was under the impression that they would be updated with the um, Revised um, amended plan, uh, specific, specifically vis-a-vis -vis the the ANC process, and and that um, and I uh, did not go back to them specifically formally to say that we've changed it. But in their letter, um, in their in their letter in the file, it says basically that if they were to, they would they would reconsider the opposition based on if it was a special exception. And is there a difference in size between? Um, your original application and the current application, the size of the of the structure. No, it's exactly the same in terms of height um, and width along the alley. The only the only difference is this cutout on the back half, to, so that our footprint is reduced, so that we can hit sixty nine point nine. Okay, thank you, Mr. Romero. Depending upon even how this goes, I would reach back out to CHRS and let them know what the new design is. Okay. Um, Understood. Thank you. Have any other questions for Mr. Romero? Chairman Hood. Um, Mr. Romero, keeping in line with the questioning, I'm I'm just curious. Is there anyone on the ANC that's also a member of CHRS? I'm I'm just curious. Is there anyone on the ANC who's also a member of the CHRS? Okay. I do not know the answer to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hood. All right, I'm turning to the Office of Planning. Uh, good morning, Chair Hill and members of the Board of Zoning Adjustment. I'm Jonathan Kirschenbaum with the Office of Planning, and we recommend approval of the special exception for law occupancy, and we rest on the record. Please let me know if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirschenbaum. Does anybody have any questions for the Office of Planning? Does the applicant have any questions for the Office of Planning? No, sir. Mr. Young, is there anyone here who should speak? We do not. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Romero, you have anything to add at the end? No, sir. Okay. I'm going to go ahead. Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to close the hearing and the record, except for what I mentioned. Uh, no, that was it, right? The hearing and the record. Yeah. Close the hearing and the record. Um, there was some, You guys, there wasn't something I was keeping open for. For some reason, I thought there was, but I guess that was the previous one. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right, going to close the hearing on the record. Mr. Young, if you can please excuse everyone. Okay. Um, I thought this was relatively straightforward after they pulled it from a variance to a special exception. I was kind of, uh, I would have thought harder about it during kind of the, the variance discussion 
in terms of uh, the original design, but I would agree that they have met the criteria for the special exception, and I would agree with the Office of Planning's recommendation and that of the ANC and also DITA. And so I'm going to be voting in support. Um, Mr. Smith? I agree with your analysis, uh, Chairman Hill. Um, if this was an application for a variance, I would be you know, hard pressed. Um, given the original uh, size of this, uh, the original application, um, it would be hard for me to see that it didn't meet the, the burden of proof for an accessory structure of that size. Um, I do believe that the application as submitted, being that they reduced the size of this, uh, of the garage, to meet the special exception criteria, is in, uh, they, they have sufficiently met the criteria of uh, the PTO1. Uh, 0.1 and 201.4 and the general special standard. Um, I would also say generally that, that we believe that design and the size and the scale of this um, this garage is largely in keeping with the adjacent garages along that alley. Um, so, um, you know, I do believe that, see, that you know, just reading CHRS's letter, uh, they were concerned about scale and size and being that this is a special exception and given some of the language they put into their own letter i think they made them fairly comfortable um, with um, the size and scale of this particular iteration of uh, of, of, of uh, the garage um, so with that i do uh, give great weight to op's um, analysis noting that the nc is also in support of, of the special exception and the adjacent property owners who are heavy, would be the most heavily affected are in support of this application. So I will also so I'll support this exception. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Vice Chair John. I agree with the comments so far and I have nothing to add. I'm in support of the application. It's fairly straightforward with the reduction of the relief to a special exception request. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blake? Yes, I too would agree that the applicant has sufficiently addressed uh, how the structure will meet the criteria for lot occupancy uh, and meets the burden of proof for granting relief. The issue with the CHRS did to me support the issue that they did recommend they look for a special exemption by reducing the size of the, of the project um, and with, with the issue being that the burden of proof for a Variance analysis, but variance relief may not be met. Uh, in this case, the special exception standard, I think, is met, and I'd be prepared to support. Thank you, Chairman Hood. I, I have nothing to add. I will be supporting this application. Thank you. With that, I'm going to make a motion to approve application number two zero five seven four as captioned read by the secretary, and ask for a second, Miss John. Second. Motion made and seconded, Mr. Moy. If you could take a roll call. When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief requested. The motion to approve was seconded by Vice Chair John. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Blake? Yes. Vice Chair John? Yes. Chairman Hill? Yes. Staff would record the vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve, seconded by Vice Chair John, also in support of the motion to approve, Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, and Chairman Hill. Motion carries on the vote of five to zero to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Uh, when you get a chance, Mr. Moore, you can call our next case. The next case before the board is application number 20576 of 1606 strategies 1631 13th street llc this is a uh, final amendment 
to a self-certified application for special exceptions from the matter of right uses subtitle U section 301 pursuant to subtitle U section 320.2 and subtitle X section 901.2 court requirements subtitle E section 203.1 pursuant to subtitle E section 5201 and subtitle X section 901.2 Rare addition requirements, subtitle E, section 205.4, pursuant to subtitle E, section 205.5, and subtitle X, section 901.2, and the lot occupancy requirements, subtitle E, section 301.1, pursuant to subtitle E, section 5201, and subtitle X, section 901.2. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this would construct a Third story with, I believe, a roof deck and rare addition to an existing attached two story with cellar, four unit apartment house in the RF1 zone. The property is located at 1631 13th Street Northwest, square 277, lot six. The preliminary matter here, Mr. Chairman, is the applicant filed a motion to waive uh, his deadline, his filing deadline, um, in order to for the board to allow into the record revised plans and an amended self certification. Okay, Mr. Solomon, can you uh, introduce yourself for the record, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Marty Sullivan with Sullivan and Barrows. Mr. Solomon, the plans and the the self cert the rise whatever is that what you presented to the ANC? Yes, yeah, the change that we requested late was really minor. It was just adding a, a dimension on it, it was it was not uh, material, but we wanted to make sure the plans were exact. Okay, when you do go over your presentation, okay. maybe you can just point out where that change is. Sure. Okay, and then uh, let's see, um, <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, I don't know if you knew this and it doesn't matter, but like your name is in all caps. Everybody else's name has like, you know, the first M and just it doesn't bother me or anything. I'm just letting you know for all Zoom calls, your 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 name is like in all. Yeah, and this is the first time I actually didn't put my name in at all. I don't know. Uh, I, I know it just, it was a, just automatically populates. Interesting. I okay. don't. Or well, maybe it's when I sign up to testify. Possibly, I all will. Right. I will check. It doesn't matter. Right. Just Thank curious. You. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I just add, since we're going down these lines, if it's in all caps, most of the time it signifies that you're yelling. So, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, hopefully you won't yell at us. Yeah. It's not it's not my style, I hope. Um, Mr. Sullivan's kind of calmed down over the years, I think, uh, Chairman. <laughs> you know, at least while I've been with him. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, at the very beginning, there was a little bit more yelling at the very beginning, Mr. Sullivan. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't remember that, but okay. Yeah. You say so. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. All right. Uh, okay, Mr. Sullivan, if you can go ahead and walk us through your applicant's application and, again, why you believe you your client is meeting the criteria to grant the relief requested. I got 15 minutes on the clock there, and uh, you can begin whenever you like. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, if we could go to the next slide and then turn it over to Mr. Cross to explain the project. It's this is the RF1 zone. It is a an apartment house that was not a purpose built apartment house. It was previously converted to four units. There is a CFO for four units, and it's an existing four unit building. And uh, so, structural expansion of that type of building is um, not permitted without special exception relief. So that's the main reason we're here. And in addition to that, there's a couple other areas of relief for this. Uh, what is a third story addition? We do have the support of ANC 2F and the Office of Planning and DDOT. Next slide, please. Areas of relief, which Michael will go over as he presents as well. Uh, closed court width area. There is an existing closed court and there's a stairway being put in there and moved there. And that requires some some relief for the court uh 10 foot rule the third story the existing footprint is already past the 10 foot and the third story is just going on top of that existing footprint uh lot occupancy relief and the aforementioned structural expansion of a previously converted building uh next slide please and i'll turn it over to mr cross Mr. 
Mr. Cross, can you hear me? I can. Sorry, I uh, wasn't quite sure if Mr. Sullivan was uh, finished. Uh, so, could you introduce yourself for the record, Mr. Cross? I can. Michael Cross, uh, uh, project architect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the the property uh, is being proposed here at 1631 13th Street Northwest, um, which is Mr. Cross. Let me interrupt you a second, Mr. Cross. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I did do this. So I know that I asked Mr. Sullivan about what he has what he was trying to get into the record. I don't know if I said that. Let's go ahead and allow it into the record. So I am going to now say let's please go ahead and allow the items that Mr. Uh, Sullivan was trying to update for his client into the record unless any of my board members have any issues and if so, please speak up. Okay, all right, Mr. Cross, you can go ahead and continue. I'm sorry. Sure, and to your previous request of noting those during the presentation, I actually do not know exactly which items have been updated. So Mr. Sullivan will have to point those out as we go. Uh, this project's being proposed at uh, 1631 uh, 13th Street Northwest, which is on the east side of the block between Q and R, potentially more precisely between Corker and, and R. Uh, those don't go all the way through. Um, we're proposing to expand the existing four unit apartment house by adding a third story above the existing structure and reconfiguring the existing four dwelling units. Next slide, please. Again, some views of the area. Next slide, please. As seen from the rear. Next slide, please. This is uh, taken from 13th Street, showing the elevations of the properties along the row. Ours is the uh, shortest building among this group, uh, the white flat front building. It sits between uh, the red brick building with the uh, octagonal bay and another uh, slightly taller, flat, more cream colored building uh, that's connected to the church. Next slide, please. Uh, here, seen in context, looking down or up the block. What did the church have to say? I, I forget from the record. Uh, yeah, I think the our client can speak more to it, but uh, I was on a call with the with representatives from the church uh, on November fourth, uh, at which time they it didn't express any uh, concerns. Um, I don't know if we have anything in writing from them, however. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, there is an alley uh, just uh, two doors down or two doors up uh, north of the property here as shown in this, this uh, image. Next slide, please. This is a view from the rear, um, our building being the uh, square uh, masonry facade with four uh, inset windows. Um, you can see that our building does project past both properties uh, to north and south, um, left and right on this page. Uh, we are seeking relief from the rear yard, uh, 10 foot projection rule and uh, the property that it is currently non-conforming with uh, is the one to the right in this photograph. Next slide, please. These are some images inside that court. It is an existing court, which is non-conforming. It does have an existing staircase, as you can see in the for, uh, photos here, which uh, uh, makes it further non-conforming. Next slide, please. So uh, we're proposing, um, I guess, uh, to kind of Put all that into context, uh, it sounds like a lot of relief as read out by Mr. Moy, um, but I think the, the easiest way to understand this is the existing building, as you've seen, um, is already uh, non-conforming uh, and we are seeking relief to essentially maintain and expand that. 
uh, specifically regarding uh, the court, the nonconforming court, the, the projection past adjacent structures, uh, which we would maintain in its nonconforming uh, uh, condition, uh, its lot occupancy, we would continue to be and ex slightly expand that nonconformity. Um, and we're obviously extruding this volume up, which extends all of those conditions. It should be noted that this building is in a historic district. Uh, we have worked with OP uh, uh, extensively, uh, including the ANC on those matters as well. And uh, we have received approval at this point from HPRB for the project uh, proposed here. Next slide, please. So this is the existing site plan. Uh, as, as noted, uh, there's a non-conforming court uh, there in the middle of the property on the right-hand side uh, with an, egress, an existing egress stair in the middle, as you saw in the photos. You can also see how it projects uh, past both buildings, uh, both on the left and right but uh, specifically projects more than 10 feet past the existing building on the right of this page, which I believe is north. Uh, and the uh, building itself, its current footprint, which we're not proposing to expand, is already a, a beyond the matter of right allowable with an existing percentage of lot occupancy of roughly 64%. Next slide, please. This, this uh, slide shows our proposed uh, site plan. Again, no change in building footprint. We have reconfigured the stairs that are being proposed located in the court, um, but the court remains non-conforming. Uh, itself and with the stairs. And we've added a new egress stair on the rear uh, to handle the occupancy uh, of the proposed roof deck. Uh, that contributes to an increased lot occupancy um, proposed to be 70%. Next slide, please. This building section shows uh, an additional story. It's a simple extrusion of the existing footprint without any expansion. Uh, the proposed building is below which, uh, the building height is below which uh, is allowable as matter of right. Um, we have eliminated any penthouses that might be proposed to serve uh, the, the occupied roof to keep uh, the overall height down. Uh, and the roof decks themselves uh, have been designed in accordance with both the regulations of zoning as well as the uh, guidelines from HPRB uh, to uh, protect the sight lines of the building as seen from public right away. Next slide. So, Kind of in summary of what we're doing here, uh, we're adding an additional third story with a new mansard roof and a shed dormer. Uh, we're replacing some windows on the front facade with larger compatible windows. We're replacing the existing front stoop. We're adding a new area way to access the uh, cellar underneath that stoop. Um, and we're adding some new exterior spiral stairs on the rear facade. Um, all of this is matter of right with respect to the zoning regulations uh, and furthermore has already been uh, reviewed and approved by HPRB in their meeting on 11-18. With that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Sullivan and remain available for questions uh, should you need. Thank you, Michael. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please, and I'll go through the special exception criteria. But first, I want to mention the changes. There were two small changes for which we asked uh, for the waiver. One, the height dimension was on the self-cert, and the plans was listed as 33.9, and it's actually 34 feet. So it went up a tenth of an inch. And the parapet walls 
uh, on a on the iteration that we filed 21 days prior were too high. They were six inches too high, higher than they're permitted to be. So they were lowered. And so that's why we refiled plans on the, the day after the 21 day deadline. So those were the two changes. <clears throat> uh, general requirements for all these areas of relief, granting relief will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the regulations for several reasons, residential conversions, of uh, apartment houses constructed before 2015 are considered conforming uses under 301.4. Um, and the zoning regulations specifically permit the expansion of a previously converted building by way of this relief. And other applicable purposes in the RF zone are the preservation of housing stock and reinforce the importance of neighborhood character. Granting relief will not tend to affect adversely the use of neighboring property as demonstrated with the special, the specific special exception criteria for the applicable relief. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so for the 320 relief, this is the relief of special exception for a structural expansion of a previously converted apartment building. The building to be expanded is in existence. It is obviously. Uh, the 320.2B relates to the fourth dwelling unit and the every additional unit being subject to inclusionary zoning. This already has four units, so no units are being added, so that doesn't apply. And the 900 foot rule also uh, doesn't apply because we're not adding units. These are all existing units. Next slide, please. So the specific criteria that relate to all the areas of relief are the light and air to neighboring property should not be unduly affected. <laughs> the surrounding area includes a variety of land uses and heights. And um, some many of the surrounding buildings in the area are taller and larger than the subject property. The extension beyond the 10 foot rule is just four and a half feet and it's just for one story uh, on top of the existing footprint. So we're not expanding the footprint. Um, Privacy of use and enjoyment. The property does not have any windows directly facing either of the neighboring buildings. And there's no windows uh, in any of the areas needing relief. And the stairs and the light well also does not do not have views of the adjacent property at uh, uh, to the north at 1633. And the stairs, the rear of the subject property also uh, will not have unduly intrusive views of either adjacent property and are intended to allow rooftop deck access and provide additional means of emergency egress, not for prolonged occup occupation, such as a balcony. Next slide, please. And finally, the proposed addition or accessory structure together with the original building is viewed from the street alley and other public way shall not substantially visually intrude upon character scale and pattern. Uh, and I think the, the best evidence here, although it's not uh, I understand this is a separate decision, but uh, as HPRB has approved this as being compatible with the historic district. Uh, this area is characterized by road dwellings, flats, and multifamily residential uses. And when, when viewed from 13th Street, the addition will be within the range of heights on the block. And similarly, when viewed from the public alley, the addition will be within the range of building heights and massing for the area. And there's still a, a quite large rear yard of 27 feet, nine inches in the rear, which also helps the character scale and pattern as viewed from the alley. Um, and that's that's it for our presentation. If the board has any questions. Mr. Young, can you go back? Don't pull it yet, Mr. Young, if you wouldn't mind. Can you go back a couple of slides for me? Right there. So, Mr. Cross, I'm just going to ask you, like, and I, I mean, it is helpful to the board, or at least it's been helpful to me to understand what is matter of right versus whatever it is. I mean, if it were matter of right, you guys wouldn't be here. So, when you said matter of right, what did that mean to you? So, I think, uh, particularly in relationship to this slide, um, uh, on this slide, I was speaking about some of the more uh, aesthetic changes uh, being made and proposed specifically in this slide the addition of the third story with the new mansard uh, and dormer 
uh, replacing existing windows with larger compatible windows, uh, the existing front stoop, front area way to access the, the area underneath that new stoop. Um, and I guess that's it. So I guess to be more specific, those elements are all matter of right, but I did wanna mention them because they do go to uh, character of the neighborhood. Uh, to your point, more specifically, the addition of the third story and the spiral stairs on the rear are part elements that we are seeking relief for indirectly uh, as listed in the previous slides. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Just again, and even when you guys presented the A and C's, you know, like when you use the term matter of right, and then you can maybe specify what is matter of right so they understand it perhaps better, because Again, matter of right means you're not going to be here, which is great because I don't want you to be here either. So, oh, no offense. All right. Okay. Um, do y'all want to pull the deck or does anybody have any questions while the deck's up? And if so, raise your hand. Okay, Miss John. I can't hear you, Miss John. Sorry, you're on mute. Oh, second time today. Can you, Mr. Cross, can you point out the ports for me? Um, I'm looking at um, page four of the exhibit, and I see the stair access um, beside the green roof. But where is the second um, court? This is um, exhibit 44, um, slide four, one showing the footprint. Mr. Young. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I follow the specific page number that you're citing, because I agree with Mr. Young. That's the page of Exhibit 44 that I'm seeing listed as number four. Um, it's where you describe, of, can you pull up the slide that you use to describe where the courts are? Sure. Uh, let's skip to uh, page number 13, Mr. Young, please. Um, page number 13 of Exhibit 44 uh, shows the existing footprint. In this, you'll see the courtyard there on the right-hand side of the building that's adjacent to the property line. Yes. Within that courtyard is a rectangular set of uh, stairs in the existing condition. Mm -hmm. If you go to the next slide, please. There you go. Uh, uh, this slide shows the proposed condition. The extents of the court itself have not changed. Uh, however, the stairs within it have been reconfigured. Uh, technically, Court, uh, the stairs are actually creating two courts in both the existing and the proposed case. Um, and those courts have changed. Uh, however, they were, they are always non conforming in both cases. And I would add into that anytime we, you build up on around a court, you're extending that existing non-conformity of the court because the, the requirement itself increases with the height of the building. And so that necessitates uh, adding this relief to this request. So, so Mr. Mr. Sullivan, I understand that, but I thought there was a request for closed court number one, closed court number two, and I'm trying to figure out where those are. That's my issue. I see the one you're describing to me. Is that number one or number two, or, or, or are we discussing the extension? I think the confusion is uh, you and I see it as a singular court, right? Because uh, the court is that setback area from the property line. Unfortunately, uh, technically, the voids around that stair create two separate courts, uh, even though the rest of us might understand the building to have uh, essentially a singular court. And so the slide that you're looking at now does contain both courts. 
one of those courts is the larger void in front of the spiral stair proposed in the new uh, court. And the other court is the void below that spiral stair um, in that same court area. Is that clear enough? Absolutely not. <laughs> so the spiral stair is at the rear of the building, right? Uh, the spiral stair I'm, I'm referencing now is the one that is located within the area on the side of the building that contains the court or courts. Okay, I get. I think I get it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else for the slide deck? And if so, just speak up because I can't see everybody. All right, Mr. Young, you want to drop the slide deck? And maybe the Office of Planning can also address the court issue, but um, can I turn to the Office of Planning? Sorry. Um, sorry. We can kind of see you, Mr. Morton. That's right, but we can hear you. I know. I was just trying to, um, didn't know which um, camera was looking at me. Uh, the Office of Planning is in support of this application and um, and recommends approval of all the relief that has been requested. Now, as for the courts, I have to admit, I was also confused by this, and Mr. Sullivan's office had to explain it to me. So it looks like one court, and I think typically, if we look at a building, not looking at it for zoning or anything, we would say that is one court. But what's dividing it is that staircase in the middle. So I think usually, intuitively, we don't think of a staircase as taking a court and dividing it into two, but it is a structure in the middle there, and it creates these two separate courts um, with a staircase in the middle, because they're, they're putting that new staircase in that goes all the way up to the top. It's a circular stair instead of the... Um, I don't know, more conventional stair that's going from the basement up to the first floor. So therefore it's not dividing the courtyard. Um, but the new stair, because it goes all the way up to the roof, so to provide access to the roof for the um for the tenants actually divides it in two with the staircase in the middle. Um, so does that help explain the two courtyards? Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Morfin, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, only that, and I mean, I think I already said it, but we do support this application. We recommended approval of um, all the um, requests for special exception approval that they made, finding that they were in conformance with the specific criteria necessary for their granting. And so okay. that's all right. That. Yep, I got you. Um, okay. Mr. Blake, yeah, could you could you just possibly just say which one is court one and court two, on just overlay that which is court one the near or the far the one to the rear just which one is which? Oh, let me open up all of that. Um, I'm not sure which one off the top of my head. One second, because I don't know which one is court one and which one is court two. Does the applicant? No better which one is court one or court two. Um, because I'd have to open up all the. Drawers. I thought court one was the furthest one north, or I don't know, the what looks north in the drawing. Uh, the one closest to the street, I think that's um, to the west. Hold on. The west, yeah. So there's, there's, uh, we're on the side of the building. And and then so there's a stairway there in the middle of the existing court. And to the west of that is court one, to the east of that is a very small court. That's court two. I don't I'm not sure if we numbered them, but that if, if we did, that's how I put them in order in the on form one thirty five. Court two is the one closer to the rear yard. And court one is the one closer to the street.
Mr. Blake, did that work for you? Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. That was a clarification I, I wanted. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Anyone else for the office of planning? Mr. Morton, I had a question. Like we have, and maybe can you explain why this isn't an increase of a nonconformity? Well, it's four units today. It was created um, when they could still do it, create the four units from the original two unit building that was built, I think 1931. So what they're doing is they're going to maintain those four units. It's just going from a four unit building to a four unit building. Um, although each unit will get bigger, um, it's still a four unit apartment building and that's why um, they don't need relief to make larger units because they're only increasing each apartment unit. They're not increasing the number of units. But they're not in, but they're increasing that non-conforming court, right? They're, yeah, well, they're creating the non-conforming I'll get you, Mr. Sullivan. What, Mr. Morphin? They're creating the non-conforming, yeah, because they're putting, they're creating two non-conforming courts by putting the staircase up through the middle of it. Um, so yeah, I'm just, cause I'm just trying to understand for other cases that we do, like, I mean, and Mr. Sullivan seems to have an answer for me, which is that you're increasing, you know, you're, you're raising that non-conforming court up, right? Which I'm fine with. I'm just trying to understand, is it an increased nonconformity? And Mr. Sullivan, you seem to have an answer for me. It is, it is increasing a nonconformity and under a, a text amendment, um, from last summer, I'm going to say July of 2020. Um, it was it was made clear that, or, or you know, the interpretation was that relief from C202 is no longer needed if you're asking for relief from the specific. Um, C202 directs you to get relief from the specific um, development uh, area development standard. So. So we need relief from the court. We need relief from the lot occupancy and uh, C202 is redundant. And that text amendment, knock that out of there. If that's what you're asking and why, why you don't see C202 showing up again as an area of relief. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm getting my answer, but that's okay, Mr. Sullivan. Um, okay, does anybody have any questions, for, further questions for the Office of Planning? Okay, and Mr. Nicholas, are you there? Yes, Mr. Chair. Maybe I can ask you a question that I have that I'm trying to understand, but we can do it another time. You can just kind of okay. maybe circle back around to me, okay? Okay. All right. Um, okay, Mr. Young, is there anybody here wishing to speak? I do not. Okay. Mr. Sullivan, is there anything you'd like to add at the end? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing on the record. Uh, Mr. Young, you can excuse everyone. I'm going to pick on somebody else because I'm just getting kind of tired. Mr. Smith, would you be willing to begin? I'm sure I'll be, I'll be willing to begin. Thanks. Um, so uh, I, I do believe that the applicants met the bill. I do believe Mr. Smith, after, I don't know why you're kind of breaking up a little bit. I'm breaking up. Yeah. Uh, or you were somebody me. else's story. All right. Does anybody else want to start? Let me see. Okay. Vice Chair John said she'd start. All right. Until Mr. Smith gets going. But Mr. Smith, I think you might want to drop your video. Yeah, uh, maybe just because, but uh, you were kind of breaking up. Better. Yeah. Sound better now. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and start? And let's see if you sound better or not. Okay. I do believe that the applicant has met the burden of proof for us to be able to grant special exceptions um, for um, uh, dealing with the uh, the courts and the um, the rear addition and the lot occupancy. Um, looking at special exception criteria, um, I, I do believe that the the size is the size scope 
bulk of the building is largely in character with what we are to see there to the south and a couple of uh, properties um, to the north. And Mount Iliad uh, Baptist Church still scales over uh, that entire block. So I do believe that the, the, the proposed size and the scope of the buildings of the building is in, would be in character with the block. Um, question of um, the courts. I, I do understand uh, what they're um, the, the point that they're attempting to make here is that. Um, the existing um, court is is not conforming as it is now. So, in them reorient, reorienting the stairs, it creates two um, two courts that would be uh, non conforming. So, in rejiggering that court, it triggers a, a special exception. Uh, special exception, as far as I can tell, um, and I do believe that. The way that they reorienting it, um, it, it wouldn't have an adverse impact on the adjacent um, on the adjacent properties um, within the area. So, um, I will note that we didn't receive any opposition for this um, application. Um, given OP support, I am in support of uh, this application and look at OP's analysis. And also the information that the applicant provided for us is uh, you know supplemental information. Um, so with that, I will support the special exception. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Thanks for going first. Also, Vice Chair John, I was going to um, say much the same. I I really thought that the applicant, um, Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Cross, did a good job of explaining how the application meets the um, criteria for relief on the U320.2. And most importantly, the, um, there is no change in the footprint uh, and the lot occupants relief is needed for the addition of the other floor. And um, I agree with Mr. Smith that in terms of scale, character, scale and pattern, the, the project is consistent um, with the context of the neighborhood and that street in particular. And the, the court relief was a little confusing because it was difficult to see what was six feet and, and so on. But I believe the exp explanation helped uh, me to clarify how placing the stairs in that location could create two, um, two courts. So, I, I thought that um, with the testimony and the um, the uh, the exhibits in the record, this has turned out to be a fairly straightforward application. I will give great weight to the report of the Office of Planning as well as DDOT's um, uh, DDOT's report, which DDOT does not object um, to the project, um, and ANC. To F voted in support with no issues or concerns stated. So I'm in support of the application. Okay. And I apologize. There's someone at my door. Can you all just hang on one second? I love.
I apologize to everyone. I'll just wait for everyone to get a chance to get settled in again. Okay, great. Uh, so Miss John had just finished her um, analysis, I believe. Um, Mr. Blake? Sure, uh, I, uh, I concur with the assessment of the board member Smith and Vice Chair John. Uh, I believe the applicant has sufficiently demonstrated how the proposed development would meet the criteria for lot occupancy, rear yard and closed court relief. Uh, as well as the standard for U320.2 relief. Um, I think it's a very attractive building and it definitely fits within the character, scale, and scope of the uh, uh, neighboring properties. And I'd be very uh, comfortable with supporting this uh, application. Chairman Hood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without repeating everything, I, I would associate myself with my colleagues, especially our uh, board member Blake, and, and citing the statutes and the uh, subtitles that of relief that have been requested and I think that they uh, meet. I would just also add, I understand the discussion dealing with the courtyards and I understand where you were going, Mr. Chairman. I'd be interested in hearing uh, what comes back from uh, uh, Office of Zoning uh, Legal Division. Uh, I see, I think where you were going with that question, but I appreciate the explanation dealing with the courtyard, um, with, the, with the closed court issue and um, Accept that, and I think um, this, as far as I'm concerned, this is ready to move forward for our approval. For my approval, I will be voting, voting in favor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will agree with everything that's been said. Um, it is also um, nice to see that there's there are three bedroom units, which uh, kind of increase that type of capacity of housing for the city. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve application number two zero five seven six, as captioned and read by the secretary, and ask for a second, Mr. Blake. Second. Motion made and second, Mr. Moy. If you could take a roll call, please. When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to a motion made by Chairman Hill to approve the application for the relief being requested. The motion to approve was seconded by. Mr. Blake. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Blake. Yes. Vice Chair John. Yes. Chairman Hill. Yes. Staff would record the vote as five to zero to zero. And this is on the motion made by Chairman Hill to approve. Seconded by Mr. Blake, also in support of the motion to approve, Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, and Chairman Hill. The motion carries on a vote of five to zero to zero. Okay, thank you. Um, if you all don't mind, um, I'm I'm caregiving here for my parents, and then and something just um, came up. If I can have like five minutes, and then uh, uh, we can come back, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Hood, five to ten minutes. Okay, and, and then I'll be and, back and, in five, but you can and, have two. And then we can, and then we can. We'll have one more case, and then we'll just do be done. Okay, thank you.
Hello, Mr. Moy. <clears throat> Here. Um, Mr. Moy, I just got a message um, from Chairman Hill and he has an emergency. So oh, I'll go ahead and get started and we'll see how far we get. All right, very good. Okay, Mr. Blake, Mr. Smith, Mr. Hood. And Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Yes, he's here. Okay, very good. So the, 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 the board is back in its public hearing session and the time is at or about 1230 PM. The next and last case application before the board is application number 20537 of Margaret McAuliffe and this application is as amended self-certified application uh, for special exceptions from the rear addition restrictions of subtitle E section 205.4 pursuant to subtitle E section 205.5 subtitle E section 5201 and subtitle X section 901.2 and the lot occupancy requirements of subtitle E section 304.1 pursuant to subtitle E section 5201 and subtitle X section 901.2. This would construct a rare two story addition to an existing attached two story with cellar principal dwelling unit in the RF1 zone. The property is located at 1227 E Street Southeast, square 1019, lot 58. Uh, the only other thing I have for you, uh, Madam Vice Chair, is that we do have persons signed up to testify. You do or do not? We do. We do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Fowler, are you presenting today? I think your mic is off. Sorry. Uh, Mike Fowler from Fowler Architects. Okay, thank you. Um, can you uh, tell us how your application meets the criteria for um, relief? Uh, yes, um, we are proposing a two story rear addition and uh, carriage house located. The carriage house should be located at the rear of the property over an existing parking spot. Um, we are asking for relief for lot occupancy and the uh, rear extension requirement. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, after our initial ANC meeting, um, we redoubled our efforts to work with the adjacent neighbor. Um, we revised our initial application um, in order to gain the support of, of the neighbors and the ANC. Um, and what's uh, presented now is, uh, is the revised application um, where we've reduced the overall size of the rear addition introduced a, a setback at the second floor um, on the side. Uh, and uh, we actually, between the previous uh, application and this one or submission in this one, I added the, the carriage house um, at the rear um, of the property. Um, as far as uh, light air and privacy, uh, again, we worked with the neighbor to um, to reduce the uh, the effect of uh, the addition uh, onto the adjacent properties, um, we reduced the overall size and the, the side um, setback uh, also allows for more light and air uh, to to the property to the west. Um, the uh, this is in the historic district. Um, we have. Uh, Submit an application to uh, HBRB. Our hearing is this month. Um, we have uh, discussed the project with staff, and at this point, they they have no concerns. So, as far as the um, you know how it's going to fit into the neighborhood, we feel that the scale, the materials are, are both appropriate. Um, you know, for those reasons, we feel that we, we meet the standard um, for a special exception. So. Um... 
I see that there's a, a shadow study in the record and can you tell us um, a little bit about the shadow study and do you need to pull up the exhibit? I believe, I believe it's at exhibit 46. Um, yes, uh, you can. Um... Mr. Mr. Um, Young, can you put exhibit 46 up? Okay, this, uh, we, we did this shadow study for, for, for multiple reasons. One, um, uh, that the neighbor had some concerns about, uh, the effect of the shadows on her rear, uh, deck and her garden. Um, as well as she also has solar panels on her roof. So we needed to establish the, the impact, uh, in those areas. So, um, what we did, uh, we looked, uh, the main concern for the neighbor was was the growing seasons, you know, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so we looked at those times and did a, a comparison before and after, um, uh, and, and that's what helped us to uh, design that that side setback and establish uh, the depth of the overall addition in order to minimize the impact uh, on the neighbor. Um, we highlighted her, her garden area in, in green um, on the rear yard to uh show uh, the area that she was concerned about as far as for, for growing um and then we also shaded the, the the difference between uh the existing and the proposed uh in red so um in this image you can see uh at 9 30 in the morning um early in the spring um there is an impact uh on the deck and uh the, the partial uh, part of the rear yard uh, next slide please um, and then, as you can see, uh, throughout the morning, that impact diminishes um, because of the orientation of these properties by noon, there is uh, zero impact on the uh, on the property at 1225. Um, so what we did with this study is uh, is demonstrate that uh, the impact on on the on the deck and that growing uh, garden area at the rear uh, was very minimal. Um, and we also uh, established that the impact on the solar plan panels was within the, the limit allowed uh, by the, the um, zoning regulations. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and this just continues to show the, as the morning goes on, that impact uh, diminishes uh, to, to nothing uh, near, near noon. Um, and we did this uh, for uh, multiple times of the year um, and continued uh, through the afternoon just to show uh, that there, there continues to be no impact uh, on the yard. Uh, but this was the document that was most useful in, um, in working with, with the neighbor to, to show uh, the, the impact um, and, and get, get support of her and, and the NC. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fowler. Does the board have any questions for Mr. Fowler? I don't see any hands, so I'll go to the Office of Planning, Mr. Moidfin. Mr. Moidfin. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Moidfin with the Office of Planning. And the Office of Planning is in support of this application, as was um, just described by the applicant. Um, the applicant did modify the application. Um, making it more acceptable apparently to the neighbors. So because and so because of that and it also conforms with the criteria for the special exception request, the office of planning supports this application and is available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Morfin. Does the board have any questions for Mr. Morfin? Mr. Fowler, do you have any questions for OP? No. Okay, thank you. Is the ANC present? So, Mr. Young, um, you said there were people wishing to testify? We have one witness. Could you let the witness in, please? Oh, hi, I'm just uh, here in case you need me for questions. I'm the applicant. Oh, okay. Well, I don't need thank to say you. anything if all is good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and 
What's the name of the witness, Mr. Young? I'm sorry, Margaret McCulloch. I'm the owner of the house. Okay, so we don't have an additional witness, Mr. Young. We do. We have Mr. Alan Gambrell, who's on. Okay. Mr. Gambrell, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, please introduce yourself for the record. Okay, my name is Alan Gambrell, resident of Washington, D.C. And um, can you go ahead and give your testimony? You will have three minutes. Sure, thank you, board members. Um, this is not in my neighborhood. The reason I'm here today is regarding the issue of calculation of lot occupancy, which appears to be the latest zoning gimmick that's being used to debate density rules. I want to draw your attention to what you've already heard, which is the applicant is asking for 70% lot occupancy. The correct lot occupancy is probably around 79%. Mr. Gambra? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you explain how this particular application does not meet the 70% requirement? The 70% requirement, um, I'm speaking to what the actual correct lot occupancy is, which is the, what the board is deliberating on. You're deliberating on a 70% lot occupancy, yes. but the actual correct figure is 79%, and I was going to explain why. Well, Mr. Mr. Do you have a particular drawing that you want to present to show why the lot occupancy is 79% and not 70%? Well, if you would let me finish, I would point point that out to you. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, so why? Why is it 79%? It's because the applicant is not counting in the lot occupancy, the building that is located under the deck, lo located at the rear of the building. So I'm going to draw your attention to the exhibits. If you'll go to exhibit 42, which is the applicant's revised plan, on page 6, it depicts an addition to the building at a depth of 10 feet and 3 feet 11 inches above the grade. That 3 feet 11 inches matters as far as not counting the deck. However, underneath that deck is a bunker like structure, which is part of the building. It's living space. That 10 feet extension is part of the building footprint and, and it is included in the lot accuracy calculation. On exhibit 49, which is the office of planning report, page 1 states that the extension is 18 feet. Which would include the 10 foot deep bunker I just referenced. And yet, OP mischaracterizes a lot accuracy request as 70%. Okay, thank Actually, you. And if you look at uh, I'm sorry. Mr. Gambra, Mr. Young, can you pull up that exhibit? Um, what exhibit should. Mr. Young, pull up for you. I think the most helpful thing would be exhibit 42, page six. Thank you. Let's wait to have Mr. Young pull that. Sure. Mr. Young? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay, thanks.
Mr. Moy, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Chairman, I'm Hill. sorry. There was again. I'm kind of caregiving for parents, and so my nurse, my parents' nurse. Anyway, so I'm back. But I know that Vice Chair John has been here, uh, but I'm here, and uh, I'm going to follow Vice Chair John's lead. Okay. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're reviewing Exhibit uh, 42. So please go ahead, Mr. Gambro. Sure. And it's the uh, lower structure you'll see on the, um, I don't have a pointer, obviously. It's, um, it's between the carriage house and the building itself. And it's a low rise part of the building, which is depicted as being three feet, 11 inches from the grade. Now that matters from the standpoint of not counting that deck in lot occupancy, which is under B324, Structures and Required Open Spaces. However, underneath that deck is the building. And that 3 feet 11 inch measurement is, bears no relevance to the rules of measurement for lot occupancy, which are detailed in B312. And this was further clarified under Zoning K 1718, which is a revision of the basement cellar rule, when the Zoning Commission made a modification to the building area definition to exclude some text. And I can't share my screen to show you that, that narrative. But the Office of Planning in its May 14, 2018 memo to the Zoning Commission on this rule change changed the building area definition to, to read OP recommendation. This removes the allowance for space that is still above gray. OP recommends approval of this change. Now, I know it's really hard to follow that without actually seeing these words on paper, but the reason I'm coming before you is in October, the BZA had a case in my neighborhood, Adams Morgan, where there was a similar zoning trick that was tried and it wasn't really before the zone, the board which was there was a bunker like structure which the developer characterized as being authorized under b324 structures and required open spaces and he used the word structures however the rule that applies to a building is b312 rules of measurement for lot occupancy now i reached out to and i'm going to conclude I reached out to the zoning administrator multiple times and actually this morning as well to give him alert him to the fact that the BZA was going to be dealing with this issue and he certainly should step up to the plate and provide some clarity on what the actual rules are. And as I said in October, this is a very big issue because it's yet another example where, frankly, the Board of Zoning Adjustments Authority is, um, is, is going to be um, subverted in a lot of ways. I mean, imagine if you're going to allow these these bunker like structures to come before it, then the BZA doesn't have a role in, in permitting um, exceeding the 60% lot occupancy. If, if it's characterized as not counting, then you could have a 70% and you'd have no say. I'll conclude on that basis. Okay, thank you. So j just one question, because I'm not sure I understand what you're saying right here. The, the, um, the, the structure underneath the deck, which aligns with the first floor, is a cellar because it's under three feet eleven. Yes. Okay. And you're saying that's not correct. It is a cellar, but it also counts in lot occupancy because it's part of the building. Okay. So it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's a cellar if it's part in terms of lot occupancy. Right. So you. I don't believe that that's correct, but I'll turn to Mr. Fowler. Thank you very much for your testimony. You all really kind of add one more comment. Yes. Uh, yeah, as far as the, the question, I mean, from the standpoint of the board, it's very clear reference B312 rules of measurement for lot occupancy okay. and furthermore, the definition of building area. And from the standpoint of really moving forward on this very clearly, I would suggest respectfully that the zoning administrator could weigh in and, and assist the board in clarifying what the actual rule is. Okay, thank you for your testimony. And I will um, turn to Mr. Fowler. Did you have a comment, Mr. Fowler? Um, only that that's not our understanding 
of um, of how it's how it's measured. Um, our experience with uh, getting permits, uh, DCRA, um, is consistent with the way that we've drawn it. Um, things that don't exceed uh, the four foot above the yard don't count against the lot occupancy. Thank you. I don't, I don't really have any other any questions. I just that's that's Thank our you. that's our understanding. Thank you, um, and um, Mr. Martin. Officer Planning, would you like to um, add your thoughts? I can hear you, Mr. Mr. Morphin. Sorry, um, this is a sloping property with the highest portion at the street, and then it slopes downwards towards the uh, towards the rear yard, where um, the applicant proposes to construct the deck and the accessory building back there. So the elevation of the property is measured from the front. And so as you go back, because it's sloping down, it changes what that cellar is. Um, and so therefore it is not um, however many feet, Mr. Gambrell says it is above grade because you're measuring it from the front um, and the sloping property, you know, alters that. If this were a level property flat from front to back, then um, the height of that structure would be more than four feet above grade, but the grade is measured from the front. So therefore, if you extend the line across from the front, that structure in the back, which has the deck on top, is not more than four feet above the established grade of the property. And that's why we did not count it towards lot occupancy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morphin. And I forgot to excuse Mr. Gambrell. Mr. Young, would you please excuse Mr. Gambrell? And um, I see Mr. Hood um, raising his hand. Do you have a question for the Office of Planning or anyone, Mr. Young? Yes, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I, I, I do um, have a concern. I, I heard what Mr. Gambrell said. I know he helped us a lot with the, um, the rear yard setbacks going beyond 10 feet and others. And I know he helped start that campaign. Uh, while I know it may not help the case of the BZA that he cited the BZA help with previously versus this case today, I would like for Mr. Gambrell, if you could still hear me, I don't know whether you're still here. I would like for you to, and, and we may, we need to examine any, anything that needs to be clarified. I'm always in tune to examine. I would like for you to, Mr. Moore, I would like for you to help me with this. Um, I would like for this to go on the, um, uh, on, our, on our correspondence calendar. So we can look at it and if it's something that we need to clarify to make the BZA's job and understanding for the public easier, then that's that's what we're all about. Uh, I heard you mention something that we did uh, a while back. So I would like to um, uh, make sure we clarify that. So Mr. Gambrell, I'm not sure if you're still here, but if you're gone, hopefully you've heard that. If, if not, Mr. Moy, I would ask uh, that you reach out to Mr. Gambrell and, and that he put that on the zoning commission, one of our meetings, working with Ms. Shellen, and make that a corresponding item that we can deal with. And, and if you can cite both of those cases, thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, um, Chairman Hood. Does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Mordfin or Mr. Fowler? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify, um, Mr. Young? We do not. Okay, I'm going to excuse Mr. Gambrell and, oh, Mr. Fowler, I'm sorry. Do you have any closing comments? No. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Young, I'm going to excuse the witnesses at this time. Thank you. So, I'm going to turn to the board and possibly, um, Ms. Nagelhout, if you're listening. I am not sure at this point whether I should close the record and deliberate, and I'd like to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, I can just start. I, I'm persuaded by um, OP's analysis, and, and I believe, and someone can correct me, that if the um, building height measuring point is incorrect, and I think that's what the issue is, would that be resolved at the time of permitting? And um, I don't know if OZ legal, 
legal has any thoughts, but perhaps do we need to continue the case to get clarification? And do you have any comments on how we should proceed? And I apologize for putting you on the spot. Ms. Nagelhoff. Hi. Um... Well, it's, it's up to the board what course you want to take. The board's precedent is that you consider the relief requested in a self-certified application unless you find no plausible basis to find that that relief um, is sufficient for the project. And then the ZA will make an independent assessment of whether the applicant obtained the necessary relief at the time of the permitting and if not, the applicant would be sent back or would would not get the permit at any rate. So it's up to the board whether you find a, a plausible basis to proceed now. Um, I don't really think any clarification is coming. This, this uh, you know, the, the applicant bears the risk that the ZA will agree with him. And then there's other procedures that can come into play after that. Thank you. Um... Does any other board member have any thoughts? Okay. Um, so the next question is, are we ready to deliberate? Hello? Madam, Madam Vice Chair, I would, I would accept Ms. Nagel helps. Uh, there will be some clarification. We're gonna look at it and see if we need to clarify, but let me just say, I would accept her uh, process and moving forward because the rules are what they are. Uh, if something's wrong, the ZA will not proceed. But uh, but from the zoning commission standpoint, I want to. We always make sure we want to give clear, concise direction. <laughs> so that's all I'm trying. I want to. We will. We will follow back up with that piece of it. But I, I would accept her. Um, it, it's up to the board. I, I usually don't go first. I usually yield to the board. But I think I, I would go along with Ms. Nagel House um, plan of action because if the ZA does not certify something, I'm sure they would either have to come back or, uh, or something of that nature. But I do know the Zoning Commission will make sure that what we've all our ducks in a row and we've given out good, clear uh, uh, instruction on how to proceed in that manner. I believe we have, but we'll relook at it. So thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Anyone else? I mean, I guess, and and I, I'll get Mr. Smith, because Mr. Smith, I know, at least tell me what he thinks. I shouldn't say it that way. I mean, like, he'll tell me whether he wants to deliberate now. And so, like, um, uh, I, since I can't, I, I read it, I've read the case, but I don't feel comfortable voting. Um, I just want to come in at the end so I can hear some of the testimony, some of where you are going to be. So I'm I'm not going to deliberate. I'll just abstain um, because I, I missed the initial testimony. But um, I don't know. Mr. Smith had his hand up next. Thank so, you. Um, so I, I agree with Chairman Hood's analysis on this um, particular case. This this self cert this is a self certified case, and if, if there's something that you know, the zoning administrator will read in, in, in state when it comes down to the zoning regulation, um, the zoning administrator will not proceed, and this will come back to us um, if. If there is some form of error, um, so I, I'm fairly comfortable with uh, this course of action that um, um, Chairman Hood has stated, where we we proceed to deliberate and potentially vote on this case. And then, um, uh, if there's any issue, then um, the zoning administrator will address it. And I, you know, I I welcome um, Chairman Hood uh, putting out there that uh, we will follow up on this matter just to make sure that we're clear. So. Um, Everything is from the zone administrator, BZA on down. We're communicating to applicants, um, uh, developers, and citizens that we're clear in this interpretation on how to measure law occupancy when it comes down to a seller less than four feet in height. So I would rather proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. So I don't see Mr. Blake's hand up. Well, I can say something just regard with this with regard to this particular case. I think there's a plausible argument that the correct building height measuring point was made based on the Office of Planning's uh, uh, discussion. I thought that was very compelling, and it makes perfect good sense given the slope of the building and the the experiences that we've seen so far and how that's done. Clarification certainly would be valuable. The person that 
was concerned about it indicated his biggest thing would be to have the off the zoning administrator look at it. The way that the process is set up, the zoning administrator will actually opine on this ultimately because they will have to decide to issue the permit or not. So, in fact, that will take place. So, for that reason, I feel perfectly comfortable deliberating and voting on this at this time. Okay, so I think then I'm going to close the record and um, we can go ahead and deliberate. And um, I, I too think that um, the record is, is full and um, that in this case, the, the app is, it's a self-certified application and the applicant is seeking relief for 70% lot occupants. So if the building height measuring point is incorrect, then the applicant will be, will, there would be more than 70%, in which case the applicant would need a variance. So, and the applicant would have to return to the board. So I think I agree with my colleagues so far that this will be um, clarified upon issuance of the permit, assuming that we approve the application. So I am prepared to vote in support of the application because other than this issue, I think it's fairly straightforward and that the Office of Planning has done a good analysis of how the application meets the criteria. I think the applicant has worked with the neighbor to, um, to um, uh, limit or reduce the adverse impacts to her property um, as the applicant described and as shown in the memor memorandum of understanding, which is in the record and the design changes that the applicant made to the property. And I appreciate the um, sun studies in terms of demonstrating the um, impact or lack of impact on any solar system. And um, so I, I'm, in, I'm prepared to go ahead and support the application as proposed. Anybody else? Okay. Ms. Ms. Jones, I completely agree with your analysis on this particular case. Um, to me, this is fairly straightforward um, application separate from this question about um, how we're measuring um, building height measurement point and how that applies to um, lot occupancy, which I believe as um, everyone here has stated, will be, it, this is self-certified and it will be reviewed by the zoning administrator prior to the issuance of any building permit. And if there's any issue, it may come back to us for additional relief or changes to the initial um, order. Um, other than that, uh, I do believe that the, the size and scale of the proposed addition to carriage houses largely in character that we see within this area um, adjacent to Pennsylvania Avenue, straight um, to Capitol Hill. Uh, I do believe that the applicant has, you know, uh, gone above the call of duty, I think, in working with the adjacent uh, property owners to ensure that the proposed addition um, does not have an adverse impact on the neighbor to the west west um, garden to to their rear, which isn't necessarily a, a requirement for us to evaluate, um, but definitely the impact on the solar panels is definitely a requirement for us to evaluate. And the applicant has designed has designed this addition to mitigate uh, any of those impacts that adjacent property. Um, so, uh, with that, I agree with OP's analysis of this, um, of this application and I will also state that the ABC is in support of the application and um, I will also be in support as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Blake? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Board Member Smith's assessment of the uh, uh, application. Um, I think the applicant sufficiently addressed how the proposed development would meet the criteria uh, for lot occupancy and rear yard relief. Um, to the extent that the shadow studies have demonstrated the light and air available to neighboring properties will not be unduly impacted. The comparative solar sh uh, study uh, was showed less than impact of 5%, which is consistent with the requirement. Um, and I think, as Mr. Smith pointed out, the applicant has gone out of its way to accommodate and mitigate the impact on the adjacent neighbor. 
Um, I give uh, great weight to the uh, analysis and report of the uh, Office of Planning. Uh, no, uh, no objections from DDOT uh, and EAMC in support, and I'd be in a position to support this as well. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Um, Chairman Hood. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. I would agree. I think we, we meet subtitle E502, subtitle X901.2 from the um, subtitle E of 205.4. Uh, well, I've always never been in favor of the 10 foot uh, beyond joining the building permitted to 18 feet, which I think is de minimis to learn to get used to it. I will say, though, um, subtitle E30.1, which Mr. Gambrell brought up, the BHMP was has been a major, major conversation. I just can't recall what all of our findings were. And I believe that the Office of Planning and the applicant and all have, have, um, exhausted it and follow the rule to the letter of the law. But I want to make sure to clarify if there's any discrepancy out there. I, I think that this is on the commission's duty. We're duty bound to clarify and, and correct. If not, because Mr. Gambrell not only cited this case, he cited one previously. And I want to make sure that we can either put that to rest or clarify, because we do have people like Mr. Gambrell and others who have definitely made substantial contributions to uh, the zoning regulations. So that's where I am. I will be voting in favor of this, but I will um, bring this back to the commission so we can revisit if it, if need be. So thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Hood, uh, Chairman Hood. So I will go ahead and um, make a motion to approve application number 20537 of Margaret McCullough as captioned and read for the sec by the secretary and ask for a second. Ms. Mr. John, Ms. John. Yes, sir. I ask a question before you, you go. Ms. Nagel, how can you hear me? I can. I'm just a little concerned and I just want to make sure I've thought this through a little bit. Like, again, I've read into the case. I came in at the end because I wanted to just be able to understand. And this hasn't happened on the dais before. So I just kind of want to know what's going on. I don't even know whether I should. I'm asking you whether or not I even should participate, meaning I don't even want to. I don't even want it to appear as though there was an abstain on the, I don't feel comfortable voting because I didn't see the presentation, even though I've read everything. So I don't know whether I even should be involved at this point and just not be around and just, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't even want there to be an abstain on there because I just don't feel um, as if I have enough, as if I should be voting. Do you have a thought, Ms. Nagelhoff? I agree that you should not be voting but the vote would be recorded as an abstention. You know, the order will state the vote is whatever to whatever to one with one board member, Chairman Hill, not participating or something like that. Yeah, um, so if I just don't participate, I'm just going to leave. If I just leave right now, is that okay? That's fine. Okay, I'm just leaving. So, Ms. John, go ahead and make your motion. You guys have a nice day. Thank you, Chairman Hill. Have a good day. So then I, I will start again. Um, so I will make a motion to approve application number 20537 of Margaret McCullough as captioned and read by the secretary and ask for a second. Mr. Blake. Second. And Mr. Moy, would you take a roll call please? When I call each of your names, if you would please respond with a yes, no, or abstain to the motion made by Vice Chair John to approve the application for the relief requested. The motion to approve was second by Mr. Blake. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood. Uh, yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Blake. Yes. Vice Chair John. Yes. And we have one board member not participating. Staff would record the vote as four to zero to one. And this is on the motion made by Vice Chair John to approve. The motion was seconded by Mr. Blake, also in support of the motion to approve. Zoning Commission Chair Anthony Hood, Mr. Smith, Mr. Blake, Vice Chair John, uh, no other members voting. 
The motion carries on a vote of four to zero to one. Thank you, um, Mr. Moy. And is there anything else before the board at this time, Mr. Moy? Oh, Chairman Hood. Um, Madam Vice Chair, Mr. Moore, I would I would ask that you help us to remember because once I leave, I'll probably forget. But I'd like to follow up on what I've asked you to help us with in that last case. Yes, sir. I'll take care of that right after this hearing. You usually do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Is there anything else? There's nothing else from the staff, uh, Madam Vice Chair. So thank you, Mr. Mr. Secretary. The um, board is now adjourned, and the virtual gavel has been sounded. Thank you. See ya. Mm -hmm.